Great. So let's start the day, guys. Uh, good morning and good evening to everyone. Hope you and your family are doing safe in COVID times. Our best wishes are with all of you. Moreover, thanks for those who have joined today for the half-day virtual event on how AI and other emerging technologies is changing the landscape of the insurance industry. We have participants from all over the world who have registered for the event and to want to understand more on the subjects from the quality speakers which we have for the day. Now to begin with, let me introduce myself and the company to you. My name is Nitin Navi, and I am Vice President Innovation and Strategy at AI Code Spot. I'll be your host for the day. Uh, further to that, I have been joined by my colleague, Arvind Kanan and Naveen Kumar, who will also assist me in keeping the event lively. So thanks a lot to them for putting in such a hard work and making this one a huge success. In AI Core Spot, our aim is to be number one AI-driven community all over the world so that like-minded people can be a part of the same in supporting, growing, and making it a huge success. Our mission is to serve as a hub for information regarding Industry 4.0 technologies, uh, which encompass and not limited to artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, robotics, blockchain, IoT, edge computing, analytics, 5G, drone, edge AI, digital twin, AR, VR, cloud, and there are many more and so on. We'll continue to do industry-packed webinars and hybrid events. The knowledge repository will be made from reliable data through industry thought leaders, subject matter experts, and the leaders who are in the academy and space as well. We'll enrich the content through the videos, blogs, podcasts, newsletters, digital content to shed light on the ever-evolving industry. Request all of you to go through our website, that is aicodespot.io, for further updates. Also, please like our social media handles, which will keep you all updated on what we propose to offer in the coming months and years to follow. Today's present event, obviously, is one series of events, which we have planned this month. We had a webinar a couple of days back on the similar theme. Uh, this is a half-day virtual event. It's power-packed with speakers' presentations, panel discussions, themed around how AI is transforming insurance sector. There are lots more in store for subsequent months as well, with focus on manufacturing, telecom, IoT, and blockchain till December month. So request all of you to keep connected with us and enjoy the learning. Before starting the day, I'd like to uh, tell a few things so that it can set up the tone for the amazing networking and learning day for all of you. Special mention to our technology partners, that is Digit7, who has helped us in achieving our vision and supporting us to create a platform through which we can help achieve our objectives. Their support is immense, and we are there because of them. Some introduction about Digit7 to everyone. Innovation is the corner store of Digit7. Direction fills them with purpose, and purpose provides structure. So the visionaries at Digit7 realized this a quarter of a century ago, and they have ever since provided organizations with the strategic innovation roadmaps they need to forge their futures. Innovation is their last name, and destruction is their address. They create paradigm shifts in organizations with intuitive technologies, equipping firms to endure accelerating change. Uh, some of their products and services, I'll just quickly uh, let you know through them. Smart Express Store products, e-commerce, grab and go, HPOS, admin management, smart AR, delivery pickup app, digital wallet, drone scan, blockchain-based SCM, label monkey, data mink, digital twin. Services they offer are product engineering, innovation as a service, digital transformation, customer experiences, and innovation design. For more updates, obviously, you can go to their website, which is called digit7.io and understand more in depth. Next, thanks to all our community partners, which is very important for today, which includes Levi's and Ellis, Neptune Flood, Udra Sawyer, Penn Mutual, Milliman, Itemology Consulting, Sun Life, The Doctor's Company, First Energy, Solera, NFP, and Swiss Ray. To make this event a huge success, a special mention to all the speakers who spent their time, valuable time in coming, the attendees who registered and came today to achieve their objectives through this forum. At the end of the day, what, why, what we want to do, obviously we want to gain few things out of this. First thing, 
the knowledge it's immense the knowledge which you will have from 12 13 speakers who are there for the day in a half day virtual event this will be like a, a knowledge sharing for you and if you achieve something out of this forum our core objectives will be achieved just to apprise you all there will be few polls which we would be conducting throughout the day and the same will be broadcasted to everyone as soon as you see it kindly attempt at them lastly the last point important point if anybody wants to ask questions i'll repeat if anybody wants to ask questions they can type in the q and a section which is there at the right corner of the menu option visible to all of you we'll try to get it answered as per the time permitted so there is also a hand button at the bottom of the screen which is visible to all of you through which you can even raise the hand and come to the stage in a video format It, you can ask questions to speakers as well this is very important these two things just keep that in mind q and a you can type in the chat box any time so after the end of the presentation we will have it so i'll quickly go through the agenda and let you go uh, let you guys into to get introduced to the speakers their topics so that easy for you to understand the flow and then i'll hand it over to somel jain who will be the first speaker for the day so let me share the screen guys and one of you please confirm whether you have seen my screen or not so that is good for me yeah can you see the screen any one of you just confirm you are seeing the screen i'll move on yeah great so thank you uh, so this is the introduction we we just started it's 8:45 am we started uh, it's 8:52 now uh, we'll start exactly at 9 am so first speaker for the day will be somil jain who is the vice president and consulting actuary from levice and else his topic is ai and pnc insurance rating and underwriting interesting topic to start with the day then we have jim albert chairman and co-founder of neptune flood his topic is case study of the application of ai to change the flood insurance industry very interesting topic and it's very much relevant in today's world the next by leslie slay senior vice president partner employee benefits to drop soil her topic is ai is what will fix healthcare are we ready are we ever so all interesting topics i think it's it's all covering different industries in insurance then we have ben lu who is avp in uh, pen mutual his topic is real world ai applications in life insurance we'll try to take a break in case the time permits for around uh, 10 minutes then we will have a panel discussion you can see the panelists agenda is what will be the future of ai for insurance sector we have lovely speakers for this robert eaton is there who's the principal and consulting actuary from milliman he's the moderator as well then we have misha blamer who's a uh, founder itemology consulting then we have hari krishnan pillai who is in who is a data analytics and insights uh, in sun life we have mehla kepra who is from sun life in digital innovation we have alexander bayposi who is in the doctors company as a director then we have peter who is from first energy then the next topic uh, will be by atul bora who is in solera his topic is automotive industry and artificial intelligence he is a chief marketing officer there then we have katrin who is the vice president in nfp she will take the next topic and the last topic for the day will be by daitri choch who is from swiss re his topic is ai in automotive and mobility insurance a global reinsurance perspective and applications so yeah i know it's a great agenda it's a absorbing day if you miss out on something obviously you can go back to our youtube channel and facebook channel where everything will be live after the end of the day uh, like our social media channels very important you will get the intimation So without wasting any time let me start the first speaker so that he gets some more time to speak so we can be have somil now somil can share his presentation and uh, he can just introduce himself we have some time it's 8:55 i know we supposed to start at 9 but he gets some extra time that is the first mover advantage so over to you somil All right. I hope you guys can all see my screen now. 
Anything? Can you see my screen? Yes, I can see the screen perfect well. Okay, great. And um, can you hear me also? Yes, absolutely. Fantastic. Okay, well, good so morning. So I'll go to the mute now. Uh, Somil, I'll go to the mute. I'll put my video off. Over to you now. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, nice to have you all join us today. Well, I say good morning for the folks in the United States. I know we have an international audience here. So good evening, good afternoon, where we are in the world. Welcome. Um, my name is Somal Jain. I'm going to talk a little bit about AI, specifically in property and casualty insurance. That's what I do. That's all I've known. So I, I cannot really go, go outside of that too much. Um, even though I sometimes dabble. So um, here's what we're gonna to try to cover today. I'll, I'll do a little intro about myself. Um, and before I really start thinking about what AI is, at least my view of it, I kind of wanna talk about what AI is not. So we'll, we'll, we'll cover that a little bit. Um, there's a lot, a lot to discuss. There's a lot we can cover. I only have 20 minutes and I wanna leave some time for questions also. Uh, and feel free to ask questions along the way, by the way, if if, uh, if Nitin can, if it makes sense to jump in, feel free. Um, if they want to save them towards the end, that is totally acceptable also, whatever works for you guys. But I, I want to make sure this is in discussion. This is not just a lecture. Um, what I want to spend time on is kind of going through three specific use cases. Again, there's a lot of AI happening all over the place, given that we are we are talking about um, only 20 minutes of time here, kind of wanted to restrict it to what I think are some of the more interesting ideas, some of the more interesting things that are happening in the space and, and kind of what's live right now. I'm going to take a little bit of time, talk about what I think the, 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 the future of AI is for now. Um, it's obviously going to be ever evolving, but kind of what I see as some of the next few things coming up. And then I will uh, uh, share my closing remarks. Okay. So a little bit about myself. I am a credentialed property casualty actuary, um, which means I do a lot of work in insurance related to pricing, reserving, predictive modeling, cat modeling. Uh, some of the, the more fun things that I've done um, have been a lot of new product development. I love, love, love creating new things out of a lot of times out of no nowhere. Sometimes you have data, sometimes you don't. It's a lot of fun to do that. I've done some marketing analytics, a little bit of non-traditional actuarial work, but have a lot of fun doing that. Um, I work in traditional carriers. Uh, some of the large ones you, you're, that are household names. I've also worked for some insure techs. My role right now is not that at a company actuary, but I'm actually working as a consulting actuary. What I love about that is that I get to work with several different companies at the same time. I end up uh, focusing on insure techs and new technology more than anything else, just because I think there's just amazing things happening in that space. Some of my insure techs are, are in market already. Some of my, my uh, clients are, I'm helping them get to market. There's, there's one in particular that, that we, we, we are just about to launch. So very exciting things happening there. There are others where it's just an idea and we are trying to take it from that idea on to, to kind of create something real and, and marketable out of that. So super exciting things happening there. Um, my educational background, other than my actual credentials of a, uh, degrees in math and computer science from Rutgers University, long time back, uh, completed an MBA from Wharton a few years back. Um, and thing that's perhaps most relevant to, to this discussion, I studied artificial intelligence at the University of Sussex in England. Now, this was a while back. This was back in 1998. And it was it was amazing. That was that was my first step into the the, the what things like artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, what that what that is and how kind of that comes to life. Now, back in the late 90s, it was very much um, in its infancy compared to where it is now. And some of the things that that we now call or that we used to call AI back then are, are, are not even considered AI anymore. I know that name has changed. The terminology has evolved a bit, but that that was my first introduction to it 23 years ago. And I've, I've loved it since then. Um, Okay, so I said before I get into what I, some of those use cases of AI, I kind of want to talk about what the hype is in the industry because there is a lot of hype. There are a lot of people that are um, promoting AI and insurance and are, are, are convinced that their systems, their, their, their algorithms, their technology either uses machine learning or artificial intelligence 
my view is that in a lot of cases, it's not. Um, they are very sophisticated rating engines for sure. There's a lot of amazing use of technology, technology I cannot even wrap my head around, but that doesn't necessarily make it AI. What I've seen in a lot of cases is that as, as in, in the insurance industry in general, I think we tend to be very, very data rich, but generally insurance poor. Now that's exactly where AI can step in. I think that that data is that first initial foundation to be able to, to build AI systems or to build machine learning systems with a feedback loop that kind of over time train themselves. But that's not what I see a lot in the industry right now. There are absolutely some, some very um, complex, sophisticated, useful models, but under them, underneath the hood, it's really hard-coded decision engines. So GLMs, other predictive models, start start getting into that world. GLMs, I would say, are probably, are, are, most people I think would agree, are, would not qualify as AI or ML because they are, they are essentially statistical algorithms. Once you get into things like deep learning, once you get into neural networks with, with multiple layers, um, that's where you are kind of building some of those intelligent systems. And it seems a little bit counterintuitive, but, but, if, uh, but part of the, the reason they are, they, I, would, I would be willing to brand them as AI is because it's almost impossible to understand that knowledge is stored. You cannot just go and pick one node and say, that's where my answer lies because it is much more complex than that. Um, digital marketing marketing is another area where a lot of people doubt that their systems have AI and ML machines underneath it. When I open the hood, I realize that a lot of times that's not. It's, again, decision engines. Very, very smart, complex, useful, sophisticated engines, but still not. The reason I'm, I'm having this conversation is because I don't want people to think that that's what AI is. It's not. There's so much more to it than that. And I think the, the world, certainly the insurance world, is opening up to AI and ML now. And that's what I want to talk about. Um, but it's careful to be able to separate the hype from what's real. Um, so what are some of the areas where, where AI and ML is being used? The first one I want to talk about is claim settlement. I think that was one of the areas where, where it's been used. Um, AI ML in, has been used in the, in, the, in the insurance industry for a while. Um, and some of the, the earlier uses were things where instead of, for example, in an in, in auto accident would happen, some of the most common basic kind of um, events that most of us are very familiar with. And instead of having a, a individual claim adjuster come and show up and, and look at your car, you know, kind of analyze it, feel it, look at the paint, they said, you know what, don't worry about doing this. As a, a um, as somebody who just went through an event, you don't necessarily need to have a, a person come and look at it. Send us some pictures, and based on those pictures, we can then decide if we can just settle the claim or if we need to actually go and send somebody in. That I would say is the, is the first step. And again, AI and, and ML, they're all going to keep building on these these earlier steps. The next step that happened in that was that instead of pictures, static pictures, people started asking for videos. Um, and some of it is, is the technology in our phones is amazing, the cameras are amazing, and people can just walk around, take a, take a 360 view of the car, and, and that kind of solves the, the, the problem. That, was, that gave enough material to claim injustice to be able to solve this. Where technology is now, and this is, I think, where it has stepped away from, from just collecting data to actually AI and ML, is the, the systems now can look at these pictures and videos and create 3D maps that essentially create heat maps of the extent of the damage like you can kind of see in this picture. And based on that, they can understand, hey, is this a repair or replace situation? How much is this going to cost? They can also look at the quality of the paint and, and understand, is this something that um, is going to be one of the, the cheaper things to fix or is this going to take a lot of effort? You'd be surprised how much variability there is in just the different amounts of paint on different cars. Usually it was a role of claim adjusters to go fix all of that. Now there are intelligent systems that just by looking at that video are able to account for all of that. This now is, is, is where AI and ML are absolutely having a big role in, in providing these solutions much, much beyond what, what had to been done in the past. 
it's not just cars anymore. And this is again where so, um, I'm going to ask Nathan to see if there's any way we can mute. Looks like there's some noise coming in. Uh, could the rest of the the folks please mute themselves? Um, where I'm seeing I'm seeing uh, additional um, technology coming now is is going beyond beyond just auto repair, right? That same idea around. Um, artificial intelligence being useful for for settling claims on on roofs on damages that are that are that are much more sophisticated than than a than a paint on a car are absolutely happening now. And again, what separates this as as just being data collection where a drone can fly or take pictures, send them to a claim adjuster versus AI is look the the technology is itself looking at and scanning through these pictures and saying based on prior pictures that I've seen, the technology is calculating how much damage there is and, and what the cost to repair that is going to be. And a lot of times based on these pictures, and this is where I think the, the world is really starting to turn, there's technology now where by looking at, at damages of a car after an accident, the systems, the technology is actually estimating what was the injuries, what was the extent of the injuries to people that were in that accident when they're not even there. That is amazing. This is this is well beyond what had been even I would say two or three years ago. This is this is what I'm seeing coming through now. Um, and I, I think it's only going to get better from here. But but these solutions are out here right now and this is absolutely use good use of AI in in insurance where you you don't need to wait to go through months and months of medical expenses, but but these early pictures of a of a of an accident after it has happened without passengers in there is enough to provide that initial guidance towards where the, the, what the dollar amount of those extent losses are going to be. And a lot of this, think about where it started. A lot of it actually started where people were using technology to detect fraud in accidents, right? It was and and that's that's that has also it's one of the use cases and it's an amazing use because looking at these pictures, you can, there's technology right now that can tell if this was accident was staged or if this was, was a real accident. That is, that is in my mind, an amazing use of this technology. Second use case I'm going to talk about is underwriting. Um, again, this is, this is a case where for the longest time it was very manual process. People would, would, would look through, you know, dozens of documents. They would look through pictures. They would ask the, the policyholders to submit more and more information, and and that the first step was taking a lot of that data and making it easier for underwriters to look at that data and present it all in front of them instead of them having to go and spend hours just digging it up. Still not AI. Where I think AI is coming in is the extent of the data that's coming through now is enough for systems, artificial systems, to look at that data and say, you know what. This I'm 90% sure that that this this passes underwriting muster. I don't need to send this to a person anymore, and I'm going to say approve without having any human eyes ever look at this. This is true AI, right? Now some of it is still rules based, so so I would I would make that delineation where there are cases where you're just running through a set of very extensive set of rules. That's not AI, but if the if the decision is self-learning and over time it's understanding where it made a wrong decision where it's, where, versus where it made a good decision and changing its results based on that, that is, is true use of AI. OCR, uh, optical, optic, uh, optical character reading, that's amazing. That has done phenomenal things to underwriting. You don't need to, again, submit layers and layers of, of, of manual paper, but just scanning through these documents, it can pick all the information systems need right now and again, either provide that to, to underwriters so they don't have to scour through, through pages or in some cases help pass that data directly to systems and make decisions. Um, I'm a little worried about time, so I'm going to try to go through this stuff a little fast. Here's something that's that's kind of becoming a big now is aerial uh, imagery. And we looked at, in the previous slide, we looked at how it was used to, to for claim settlements. It's now getting to a point where it's even used for underwriting. So looking at a picture like this, which the 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 drones or satellites can take and, and send back to the insurance company, they can look at it and say, I'm not going to insure this house. There's there's high level of, of risk associated with brush fires, depending on what's around here. I'm going to be extremely concerned. This might be a problem. Again, up until two or three years ago, humans were looking at this, not anymore. This is this is this is where the world's heading. 
the next thing is kind of what I'm, I'm amazed by the most in terms of the underwriting side of things, where it's moving from using those images in terms of pricing and risk assessment to actually risk prevention, loss prevention, safety measures. There's This is one example of things, devices, IoT devices, such as water leak detectors that are able to tell the difference between when somebody's taking a really long shower versus when, when there's a leak in one of the pipes. They can tell that and they can tell that early and they can flag that. So you don't have cases where somebody's gone and for or, or on vacation there's pipe burst and the whole house is flooded. Before that happens, some of these smart detectors can can alert the right person or in some cases they can even turn off the flow of water in cases like that. So this is amazing, right? This is this is use of technology, not just to say, hey, we're going to rate you less because you have a, a, a system in place. They're actually saying we're going to prevent that loss from happening to begin with. And this is this is amazing use of technology in my mind. The next one is a little bit different uh, and it spans so many more areas. But but I kind of wanted to talk about that because it's sentiment analysis, which I think is is an amazing use, again, of, of these high technology um, I guess algorithms as 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 well as tools, based on text messages, based on chats, based on emails, based on even human life conversations. There are systems that are not detecting. Hey, what is the sentiment of the customer? Is this is this customer accepting what what they're hearing, or are they upset or angry about this? This could be a a a, a underwriting discussion. This could be used to understand when a customer is providing information regarding the the app, the quote application. Are they likely honest, or, or could they be telling, telling, sharing some some uh, lies around uh, their their basic underwriting uh, information? All of that is is I would say this is still in development, but I've seen in happening there are companies that are that are using systems like this, and I'm actually going to talk about that in a in a couple of slides because that that environment is changing. But the use of sentiment analysis, I think, is something that is. Um, another good use of, of AI and kind of being able to, without even looking at somebody's face, just based on the tone, based on the conversation, being able to understand, hey, is this a, a positive conversation or is, it, is this conversation going in a direction that we don't want to have that happen? Uh, quick check in with Nathan. Any questions or should I just kind of keep going? No okay. questions till now. Guys, any questions you have, just you can type in the Q&A section. All right. I'm going to keep going. Um, so the next thing is, is uh, and this is, I would say, far more. It's the first two use cases I talked about. Uh, in my mind, that's happening already. A lot of that is is in the industry, very much live. It's kind of where um, a lot of the, the insure techs and existing technology companies are already there. This one is relatively in its infancy, um, and the idea being real-time pricing. So, so this this is not something that is existing um, rules-based decisions. This is kind of looking at the the you know here and now of the risk and kind of pricing based on that. Now, word of caution here is in the United States, certainly insurance is very heavily regulated less so in other parts of the world. And I, I, I would not be surprised if I see more of this technology coming out from, from Europe, from Asia, um, even some, some places in Africa are doing, uh, Australia, there's a ton of stuff happening in Australia. Certainly um, Israel is a hotbed for innovation for, for insurance. There's a lot of great things happening. Certainly there is a lot of innovation happening in the United States as well, but Regulation is is a bigger challenge in the United States when it comes to to kind of real time pricing as opposed to some other parts where pricing insurance is kind of like how how airline pricing is right now. You you know you can try getting your your flights now. You come back in an hour and you get a completely different price for it. Um, one of the earlier uses of this on demand insurance was was you know people either. Um, letting out their space for a, for a weekend, for a week, you know, the Airbnb kind of uses of the world. Um, and even on the flip side, going and renting places uh, and, and wanting to cover themselves for, for that duration of time. And very quickly, it evolved to a lot of very, very cool uses of this where you can go, you know, do some crazy things and get insurance um, coverage during that period of time. 
What was really cool about that was take an example of of somebody kind of you know mountain biking through some 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 very fun terrain. Um, it started out originally with property coverage. So we, so you were bu- buying insurance for the next, you know four hours that you're going to use that that five thousand dollar bike for. Now it's actually even allowing uh, there 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 are companies out there that are building these these um, insurance programs for life insurance or business interruption insurance or or, or other forms of much more complicated risks, um, much more varied risk than just property coverage on a bicycle, right? So so it's amazing to me how something that started small and people said, hey, that is cool technology. I'm going to use that. Now, just think about this, right? Just based on somebody trying to, to buy that insurance from their phone at, at in real time, they know the location, they know the time of day, they know the the the, the weather, they know the, the 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 location, they know the risk in that location. All of these things are being captured in real time and use that to, to kind of price that risk. Cool stuff. Here is something that that um, that not a lot of people may be familiar with. Maybe some people are, but it, this is in my mind what started out with telematics, right? The idea of pay as you go insurance certainly started out with car insurance, auto insurance. Um, a lot of companies out there doing pay as you go with car insurance. There's pay as you go workers compensation insurance now. So that's cool, right? So you're, 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 you're allowing people who normally may not have a lot of employees um, and therefore they don't need workers comp coverage to kind of go and say, hey, for the day, I'm gonna hire five employees to get this one roofing job done. That's a very high risk job. I should have workers comp insurance for this and I can buy it for the day. Um, so insurance is certainly evolving as this gig economy is in, in evolving as the idea of micro insurance is evolving. Um, and I, I want to see more and more of this and it's certainly going to happen. Okay. What lies ahead? So, so I think one of the big questions to answer is, is where is this innovation being driven from? I think up until now, it's coming from actuaries like myself. It's coming from claims people. It's coming from underwriting people. I think that needs to change. I think it needs to come from the very top. I think the the board members of insurance companies need to be asking the questions. They need to be challenging the insurance companies to, to invest more in R&D. They cannot just wait for AI vendors to come and, and knock on their doors. They need to be the one that's saying, hey, we need to have internal R&D groups. They need to get comfortable with experimentation. And they need to get comfortable with failing. And I think that's how our AI, AI and other cool technology is going to move forward in insurance. Um, one topic that I think we all need to be very aware of and careful about is the idea of bias and regulation. So, so if anybody has seen the movie Coded Bias, you'll know what I'm talking about. But there is a lot of um, proof, talk and proof now of cases where some of these smart algorithms are actually not as smart as we think they are. And they, there's a lot of implicit bias, whether it's race, whether it's color of skin, whether it's religion, whether it's like so many ideas, gender certainly is a big one, age. And, and instead of, of making this, the idea being like, hey, this is completed data driven, it turns out it's not entirely data driven. There's a lot of human emotion and, and human bias underlying that data and underlying how the data is fed. And, and that's kind of causing problems. Regulation has taken a hard look into this. I think it's going to, this is going to be a very hot topic, certainly in the United States, elsewhere as well. Um, there is one major carrier that has the name of a very popular summer drink that, that recently got uh, served a lawsuit because of very similar ideas where people are, are questioning their, their use of technology and AI in terms of privacy and, and holding on to some of their, their pictures, some of their data. This is going to be very, very much evolving, but this is something that as a lot of us are are in this field, we need to be aware of, we need to build systems that we can ensure are not biased. This is cool. Uh, the idea of machine learning has been around for a long time. Now this is concept of machine amnesia coming up. And the idea is if I want my data to be removed from a system, the system should be able to do that. And it's not just as simple as deleting my record because that's not where the code lies. The code is spread out across multiple nodes, across a lot of different different layers, if you think about this in terms of a neural net. Um, how do you take out anything associated with me? People are trying to do that. And I think this is going to be one of the things that you're going to be required to do soon. So you're going to have to be able to selectively unlock. Um And last, and I'm, I'm gonna, I know I'm not going to have a lot of time for this, so I'm going, to, I'm going to try to fly through this, but who is responsible? If you guys haven't already... Um, take a look at the, the, the very classic trolley problem 
and who is responsible for for kind of feeding the the data into these these smart machines and where is that going forward okay i probably ran over i love talking about this stuff uh there's a little bit of information about me contact information uh certainly feel free to reach out but uh i'll, I'll ask nitin and the moderators if there are any questions for me or if i even have time for questions <laughs> thank you so much man anyway so lovely presentation and you gave the worldwide view of how australia how europe how india and how us canada they are performing in terms of regulations and what you have in store you gave such a lovely case study to the audience i think it was amazing thanks a lot so much thanks a lot for the lovely presentation uh, guys any questions you have you can just type in the q and a section or there is a hand button you can just come up and ask to somil as well Uh, we have uh, time we have just on time so i'll just take one minute in case you have any questions i'll ask somil to carry on otherwise we'll move on to our next speaker that is jim Uh, Somil, you are on mute. I think. Uh, oh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I'm just gonna um, say thank you all for the time. If, feel free to reach out if you have any questions. It was uh, it was great. Uh, great thank you, Somil. Thank you. I, I think it was a lovely presentation from your side. I enjoyed every what bit of it. To tell you frankly, and hope to stay connected in the near future as well. And guys, you can reach to Somil any time. He has given his coordinates to all of you. You can reach out to him in LinkedIn as well. Thank you. So we'll quickly move on to our next presenter. Jim is there, who is the chairman and co-founder of Neptune Flood. His topic is case study of the application of AI to change the flood industry. Over to you, Jim. Thank you, uh, Nitin, and um, I do want to thank you also for calling flood insurance interesting in your intro earlier. <laughs> I, yeah. I don't get that very often, but uh, but it actually is a very very interesting space, and I'll I'll try and share some of that enthusiasm with you. <laughs> Uh, it's something million. which people have not heard jim i think that is uh, something which is has to be there in, and and this has to be a topic i think it's really exciting i'll mm -hmm. wait to hear from you as well yeah yeah and uh, and samil you set the stage beautifully that was that was an excellent presentation a couple of the examples that you talked about of what can happen for example in real time pricing i'll actually show you now in case study form in in this presentation uh I'll share the highlight early in this presentation that you'll actually see an application of artificial intelligence because we've 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 thought long and hard on how do you demonstrate to people AI in action, and uh, right after an intro slide here, I will switch. Uh, I will add a degree of technical difficulty and try and uh, share a different screen, and uh, and go over and show you an actual example of AI in action. So so moving forward, hopefully in my presentation. There we go. Uh, first, I thought it would be helpful to just introduce Neptune Flood to everybody on this on this um, on this on this call and the and this conference. Uh, as background, is why why am I even qualified to have this conversation? So so Neptune is an all digital flood insure tech, and I founded the company in 2016. We've since since grown quite a bit, as I'll show you here. But all digital means we've taken a very manual industry. So because it's a digital company, it could have applied to earthquake, it could have applied to fire, to cyber for that matter, to really any kind of optional insurance. It could have applied to homeowners or auto. But we chose we chose flood because it's in very much an untapped market. And I think if you're working in any of the optional insurance spaces, this is very, very relevant of how do you fill in these coverage gaps? And I'll talk about the coverage gap in a little bit. So founding the company in early 2016, and then it took a year and a half to build out the tech. Now, I only have a few years in insurance, and the team I built around me are almost entirely technologists. So we've worked in other spaces of data analytics and business intelligence and advanced software development and, and those kind of areas. And we saw what was happening in retail, for example, with Amazon.com and one-click purchasing. And then we started to work in insurance and said, why... Why is this a different universe? Why can't these concepts work within insurance? Now, Samil referred to heavy regulation, and it actually definitely has been an inhibitor to the advancement of technology in the insurance space. But it turns out there are ways to, to get this done, as, as we'll all be talking about today. 
So all digital flood insure tech. I took a year and a half to build the tech, went into beta mid to late 17, and then 2018, January 2018, was really our first policy. Well, since then, it's 331% compounded annual growth rate. And we're now the largest private residential flood insurer in the U.S. So it works. And, and we also have a commercial product offering that's growing also at a significant clip. The, the AI that we applied and the advanced data analytics we applied reduced a workflow that was greater than 100 questions down to only two. And, and those questions were not yes, no questions. But even if you think about that example, just imagine you have to answer 100 questions. And even if all you had to do was yes, no on those 100 questions between reading, comprehending, and then responding, that would take a long time. You'd probably drop out of the process before you ever got to the end. Well, re reducing it down to only two, one of which is enter your address, then resulted in a less than two minutes process for, from the moment you enter the address to getting your quote, binding your policy, e-signing and e-paying. And that's if you go really slow, but you can do it in less than two minutes. Uh, that's, that's very much a game changer. If you imagine uh, the agent experience of going through a hundred questions, do agents want to even write policies that take a hundred questions in the application versus, oh, it's only two questions and in two minutes it can be bound? Yeah, sure, I'll do that. Um, behind the curtain is our patent pending engine that we call Triton. And you've got a screenshot of it right here and what I'll show you in a minute. But that's our artificial intelligence rating engine, and I'll explain to you what, what's, what's embedded within that. The, the higher calling, really, and the, and the reason for starting the company is, the, is to make it easy to buy flood insurance. And, and coming back to that coverage gap, and this applies in, in every other optional line of insurance. The amount, percentage of people that have earthquake insurance in, in California is very low. The percentage of people that have fire insurance is very low. Um, same thing in flood. There are 62 million homes at risk, moderate to extreme risk of flooding in the United States. That's more than 50% of the homes in the US. And yet there are only 5.5 million flood insurance policies of all types on the residential side in the US. So 5.5 million in place, 62 million at risk. You can see that the gap is more than 90% of the potential market. So by making it easy, yeah, we can go and we can try and convert other people's policies over to Neptune policies, and in fact, have done a lot of that. But the real focus and attention is on educating consumers about their risk and helping people who have never had flood insurance come in and get protection. I could go on and on and on about that, but I'd like to take you into a Triton demo. So, so bear with me for a second here. And Natin, this is the... Uh, the high degree of difficulty segment of the presentation. I know when you have to switch the screen. I will do another <laughs> screen share. Okay. Let's see. I think we're going to get this. In right. the meanwhile, guys, if you have any questions, just type in the chat box in the type uh, in the right side Q and A section, so that we can take it after the end of the presentation to save the time. Yeah. Let me. Uh, I think I'm getting close here. Yeah. Uh, what I'm going to show you, if I can make this work, is the actual application of the um, of the technology. So uh, it's not letting me do this. Uh, okay, Nitin, I'm going to give it one more try here because I think I can make this work for you. Okay. So what we've done is we've we've built this tech engine. Um, here we go. Ah, oh boy, I'm not getting it to work for you. Okay, I'm I'm going to uh, to punt here and just carry on with the presentation. So bear with me and we'll come back to the pitch. Okay, 
Can everybody see my screen now? Yes. Okay. So what I'd ask you to do, and apologies for the uh, technical difficulty, but uh, confirming you can see my screen now? Yes, absolutely. Can I get a yes? Yes, Jim, we can see that. Great. Okay. So what I'd ask you to do in, in, your, in your free time is go to neptuneflood.com, and at the top of our home screen is a tab called About Us. And underneath there is a Triton Demo. And, and in there, you'll see a screen like this, which I can talk through it right now, and, and it'll be fine, but it's a lot more interesting when you see it actually live in action. So what we were trying to do was figure out how do you demonstrate artificial intelligence to people? You can say, yes, we've got AI embedded in everything that we do, but actually seeing it in action is something totally different. And what you'll see is a screen that looks exactly like this. It, it, so this is a map of the US and, and I took this screenshot a couple of weeks ago, but if you did it right now, you'd see the actual, this moment in time of 1031 AM Eastern in the US on August 27th. And, and you see this map of the US and all these green and red dots on the screen. So the little explosions that occur, like the green, green circles that you see on that screen, those are agent quotes that are occurring in real time. We wipe this screen clean every single night. So at midnight every night, it goes back to zero and it only shows the quotes that have occurred that day. And each time that you, each time an agent enters an address and generates a quote for Neptune Flood, you see one of these green exp explosions on the screen. So there are four things that happen here. One, the first is agent enters an address and it goes into our risk selection engine and evaluates the risk. We do API callouts to about 100 different data sources, bring back the results to those sources, calculate all that data in, in a risk selection. It's single risk modeling, literally down to the structure through the rooftop and the four corners of the structure so that we have elevation measures and all other relevant measures of the entire structure. And then we decide yes or no, will we underwrite this policy? Green is yes, red is no. And there are reasons, aggregation and others why we might say no, but 97% of the time we say yes. And, and so a, the agent experience is most of the time they're going to get a yes, so they wanna use this, this process. Second thing that happens, so first is risk selection. Second thing that happens is pricing. It calls out to our pricing table, brings back a price based on the risk and the lotion and all the other factors that we have and puts a price on the screen. Now that calculation of the risk selection took less than a second. So think you've entered your address, risk selection and evaluation occurs, your price comes on the screen within five seconds of you being on Neptune's site. That is our price. We're not calling out to somebody else's rating model, somebody else's, you know, Lloyd's or wherever. This is a price model and price table that we developed and we apply to every policy. Uh, the third thing that happens and probably the most magical of the things that occur here is aggregation management. So as you're probably aware, many insurer, well, every insurer manages aggregation because that's the statistical core of the insurance industry. But managing it in real time is something relatively new. So when that address is entered and that quote is generated, we've already calculated aggregation on a local, regional, and national basis. So rather than a quarterly look back or an even worse, an annual look back on aggregation to see how many policies you wrote in Harris County or wherever, this occurs in real time so that we can apply, make that aggreg aggregation decision and follow through on the commitment. We provide a quote, you'll be able to buy in that quote. And then the fourth thing that happens here is assignment of that policy to one of our buckets of capacity. So you see these little look like dice cups at the lower left side of the screen. So if, if you were seeing the demo live, you'd see a little drop into the, one of the dice buckets of each policy as, as, the, as the quote is made. Now we actually have more than three buckets of capacity and these are A-rated global reinsurers, Swiss Re, multiple Lloyds programs, a couple of other programs and, and more in the works. But what that allows us to do is, again, think Harris County or think New Orleans, because there's certainly risk bearing down on Louisiana right now from, um, from Ida, the storm that, that just generated today. Um, it allows us to write 
let's say if we have five buckets of capacity, it allows us to write five times as many policies in a region because we can distribute that risk across multiple areas. So apologies for the, the demo fail, but, but you've got it through seeing the screen and through the discussion we've just had about it. I can see the screen, I think, Jim, and I think everyone can see the screen. There's yeah. one question, Jim. Uh, yeah. So this is supplemental coverage over and above the federal above coverage by yeah. Alexander. Good. I'm glad you asked that question. This is not supplemental. This is from dollar one, and this is an alternative to the National Flood Insurance Program. So of those 5.5 million policies in the U.S., believe it or not, 5 million are under the National Flood Insurance Program. That's because for a long time, there were no other options. There were no private options in the market. It was too difficult to model flood because it's so extreme in its intensity and so massive in its catastrophe. When they do hit, then insurers stayed away and the, and the, and the federal government came in. Then you had advancements in data analytics and high-speed computing and cloud computing. And then all of a sudden, people started to be able to model this. And that resulted in now there are over 200 private flood insurers in the U.S. Um, the coverage, so it's dollar one coverage. The NFIP caps out at 250000 in coverage. The average home in the U.S. generally is above that number. So if you've if you only have NFIP coverage and your house is worth more than $250,000, you're underinsured. Um, for Neptune, we go up to $4 million in coverage on a home. Other insurers go up to two or some other numbers, but it's certainly well above two hundred fifty. dollars Sure, you can carry on. Thank you. Okay. So, Natin, I know I've got about uh, three or four more minutes here, so I'll, I'll jump through these cases. Sure. Uh, these are, this is the actual application of AI that's occurred at Neptune. And, and uh, to go back to Samil's example of data rich, and then they had an arrow over to information. I think that's it largely captures what happens here. You're, if you're data rich, but humans can't process the data fast enough to produce a result or at all because the human mind only works so fast, then, then you're missing out on information. The application of AI here in, in many cases is just beyond the capabilities of humans to produce the information generated. So for pre-fill, we talked about in the, in, the, in the Triton demo that really didn't happen, it's 100 different data points from multiple API links. So we reduce 100 question application down to two questions. Underwriting is a big case, and, and Samil talked about that, but it's fully automated with no human underwriters. So if you think traditional insurance, Application comes in, it gets referred to underwriting, maybe in an hour if you're very lucky, more likely a day, possibly a week, in commercial often two weeks for underwriting to come back and give a decision as to whether they'll underwrite the policy and for how much. In this, it all occurs within one second, and that enables that sub two minute quote bind, e-sign and e-pay. Aggregation management, I've just talked through on the Triton demo. And then the what ifs are, are super interesting. And we do this within our engine of just constantly updating our probable maximum loss modeling because each day we write 300 policies or so. So each day our book is completely changed. So, I mean, we've got orders of magnitude more policies than that, but each day the book changes in a way that your PML is changing. And so constantly updating that on an automated basis to understand your PML is really important to us in managing our loss ratios and very important to the reinsurers that, that back us. You can also look at specific storm impacts, again, like Ida and overlay that with our, with our, um, with our book of business. And then this other area of policyholder communication, I think is one that's really important and, and, a, and a good use of AI. Of course, it can help in underwriting and loss management and claims management, but this is also really important. What do, what do you talk to your policyholders about before the event occurs, before a Mississippi River flood, before a, a hurricane coming in. We can help them by knowing the path of the storm and overlaying that with our policy base. We can help them prepare for storms and floods and send out messaging to help them take certain steps that will limit their losses. And then wrapping up, this is the last slide, and I'll just jump through these. Future applications of AI insurance, and Samil covered some of these, but in direct-to-consumer, I think it's a uh, really dramatic opportunity to help people. Uh, Direct-to-consumer, we opened up a direct-to-consumer option in April 2018, uh, shortly after we launched. Um, Agent-driven is still 90, 97% of our business, but what direct-to-consumer generates is shoppers. 
people come in and, and now the, the consumer model is they actually want to research online, they want to shop online, and then usually in insurance, they will still want to convert with an agent. But having direct to consumer and providing lots of information and customized information through your DTC channel based on the unique characteristics of that homeowner or business is where AI can have a significant impact. Validation of data. So data accuracy is critical. You can take input from agents, you can take input from consumers, but having secondary validation of that through third party public sources, Realtor Zillow, government sources, et cetera, there are many of them and, and lots you can do here to control your data quality. Uh, enhanced customer service and chat bots have been written about extensively and, and uh, got great stories from our agents on how they love that. Um, claims, claims pattern recognition. Um, for example, are we seeing more claims and more losses from basements than we than our model expects? Are we seeing more claims from a from a certain town or or certain types of homes? All those kind of things humans generally can't get to, and especially on a real time basis. Well, artificial intelligence can crunch the data to help make that happen. And then future use cases, visualization. If I showed you an image of your home in a potential category three storm, I think you'd be much more likely to buy flood insurance than if I just show a generic home or don't use any visualization at all. It just helps people understand their risk. And the human side of AI, as Samil mentioned, I think is very, very critical. So that's it. Uh, apologies for the, uh, the, the, the tech breakdown, but hopefully you got the gist of it through the, uh, the aborted demo. And uh, thank you. Thank you for the, the, the uh, audience. Thank you, Jim. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the lovely presentation. I, I saw your website is showing you a real time thing, which is going on. I think it's good. good. I'm glad. I'm glad you went and looked at it. <laughs> really and uh, there's a comment by Alexander that do see an increased use of NLP to help tailor uh, flood risk. I, 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 I do. think it's a comment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I think the short answer is a yes, but but using human language and and um, and helping steer people through to understand the risk is actually one of the big the big opportunity areas here. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for the lovely presentation and stay connected with us. And I think we can do wonders together. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Nitin. Yeah. So guys, we'll quickly move on to our next presenter. Leslie Slay is there in front of you. Uh, she's senior vice president in Woodruff Sawyer. And her topic is AI, AI is what will fix healthcare. Are we ready? Are we ever? Over to you, Leslie. Thank you. Thank you, Nitin. All right. Awesome. Thanks for that validation. It's always good to know when, when this stuff is working. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining this group today. And wherever you are sitting in the world, um, I hope you enjoy, you're enjoy you enjoying your day or your evening. Uh, my name is Leslie Slay. I'm a senior vice president and partner with a company called Woodruff Sawyer. And Woodruff Sawyer is one of the largest privately held employee benefits and risk management consulting firms in the United States. We're not a household name um, unless perhaps you're going through an IPO and uh, we're pretty famous in that space. But my conversation today um, is really around the employee benefits or the healthcare side of, of, of this world of, for the, you know, for not only the United States, but for, you know, globally. Um, and, you know, will artificial intelligence bring down the costs? Because here, certainly in the U.S. and in other parts of the world, healthcare continues to get more expensive. And so we know that it will. Uh, I think the bigger question is, will the we or all the various constituents let it? Um, that's a much bigger conversation, which is going to take a lot more than 20 minutes. And certainly we have some thoughts around that. But my goal for you all today uh who have joined us is is really to have you walk away with a few things to think about. Um, I I, um, I I think this will be will be quite interesting. 
All right. So who the heck am I and why am I here today with all these other fabulous people talking about different elements of insurance? Um, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a physician and I'm not an AI expert. I'm a healthcare consumer and an employee benefits consultant. And what's an employee benefits consultant, you might ask? So um, over the last 25 years, I've had the fortunate experience to work with large companies and help them design, implement, cost out, and manage health insurance coverage or, or employee benefit packages for their employees. And as we know here in the U.S., employer-sponsored coverage is the primary source for U.S. individuals in this country. Um, so it's, it's a fascinating place that I get to sit in because I sit kind of with this Venn diagram right in the center of, of these various elements, uh, that we work with, uh, to provide health insurance to employees. Uh, I work with the insurance carriers to make that happen. Uh, I work with medical groups and physicians when things go awry. I work with the individual consumers or the patients, and we'll talk a little bit about that language and what is and what isn't as we go through this. So um, again, I have an, I, I sit at this intersection um, of all of these various stakeholders and I can see how artificial intelligence can bring a better process and better outcomes um, for us all. So always want to define the problem first, right? Um, healthcare is sick, and especially in the United States. And, you know, we say healthcare is really sick care because it, uh, it really is there for folks mostly when they're not feeling well um, or they have some sort of major health condition. And then the system itself is very sick. So I'm probably not sharing anything with you that you don't already know. But um, I just want to kind of uh, highlight a few reasons as to why that is. So nothing talks to each other. Medical groups and hospital systems, um, to some degree, really have not had the capital, the dollars to make the investments over the last 15, 20 years in the technology space to really create those pipes um, to have data flow. Um, I would say we have uninterested participants. I think when you use the word insurance, um, although with Jim, I think flood insurance now is very interesting and I am very, <laughs> I was very excited about your presentation, but you're right. When you use the word insurance, people tune out. Um, insurance is almost a dirty word. Um, we spend, you and I spend maybe 10 to 15 minutes a year at this silly, um, if we're having insurance through our employer at a silly meeting um, known as open enrollment to talk about our health insurance. And that's it. Um, we just don't understand it and it's complicated. Um, out of date treatment patterns. It's like, kind of like when was the last time you asked your physician, um, when did he have a continuing education class? Um, and I would say that in California, and that's where I'm sitting right now, um, a physician, in order to be board certified, has to uh, do 25 hours a year of uh, over four four years, so 100 hours over four years to um, continue their board certification. I, as an insurance consultant, have to do 30 hours per year. And I'm just selling insurance. Like, I'm not I'm not performing surgery. Um, so I think that the, uh, you know, doctors tend to be very solo practitioners. It's not affordable. I mean, that's a, the real, a real issue. Um, Kaiser Health News and the Kaiser Family Foundation, which is a big source of information that I use, um, posted in October 2020. Um, over the last uh, 10 years, health insurance has increased 55%. The cost of health insurance has gone up, so twice the pace of inflation and wages. There's no centralized system. It leads to over-testing because we don't have electronic medical records. It leads to over-treating. It leads to over-prescribing. This was also talked about, and this is going to be a big issue for AI. We can't really talk about it in full in today's presentation, but current laws and malpractice laws have to change in order for artificial intelligence, I think, to really have a meaningful impact um, here in terms of what we're talking about. 
Virtual medicine, the pandemic has exploded telemedicine, which is a good thing. We like that. I always like to say it just takes a good pandemic. Telemedicine has been with us for, you know, 20 years, but it really just kind of came into the forefront because people couldn't leave their homes. So how do they receive care? Telemedicine is absolutely um, uh, the beginning of some of that virtual care space where artificial intelligence um, and uh, cameras and Google lenses and things of that nature. I think will be assisting the physicians as they visit their patients virtually. Um, and then I would say that, you know, it's really hard to keep up uh, with technology. I mean, let's be real. Doctors' offices are still using fax machines to communicate, right? And do I really need to say more? Let's look at a little history lesson, and this is why this has to happen. So this is why I'm really bullish on AI and technology. And I'm super excited about the opportunities that we have in this space. So um, for any uh, investors out there or folks that are working in AI in the healthcare or health tech space, please, please, please keep doing the good work. Because look at the left-hand side of this page, right, um, and all of these industries that have been um, transformed by technology, and healthcare isn't there yet. OK, um, it's it's um, amazing that it has been it still is kind of the last bastion um, for for change and for reform. And I might have missed a few or a couple on this left side, um, but let's talk about it in terms of spend. Right. Healthcare, according to the CMS um, in 2019, uh, basically equaled three point eight trillion dollars or eleven. $11,582 per person in the United States, right? The next largest, I think, uh, business up there, it would be finance and banking, which is just like $22.6 billion um, in 2022. So in just in terms of the spend that goes on in healthcare, artificial intelligence absolutely will be able to, I think, transform that spend and bring it down. Um, so I think just, again, a lot of opportunities opportunity there. And I would ask again um, if uh, folks have have joined us uh, most recently, if you could make sure that your uh, mic is muted. I am getting a little bit of feedback, so I appreciate that. All right. We say we've got to bring costs down, but first we have to make them transparent, right? There's no teeth in that yet. There's a law that was passed in the United States last year that Congress signed into effect as of January 1. So as of January 1, 2020, all hospitals were supposed to report and publish in a public fashion on their websites um, or in other spot uh, their top 20 uh treatment or top 20 services that they perform and the cost that they charge for that. Um, as of last week, we have 94% um, of hospitals are not in compliance. Okay, it's a big issue. We all know this costs too much, but we really don't know what it costs because, you know, it's amazing to me. It just kind of blows my mind. It just keeps getting more expensive, but yet there's no accountability in the market to have any sense of what the actual retail or even wholesale costs for a lot of these hospital services and physician services should be. So it's um, there was a really well-published article in the Times a few years ago um, this, uh, magazine where hospitals were charging up to 700% over Medicare for some procedures. I mean, in what other uh, business can you afford to charge 700% over, over cost, we'll use Medicare rates as your base rates for cost, right? Um, and get away with it and have that be okay. Um, so I think, you know, the market has responded in terms of kind of moving in order to create uh, less expensive programs and insurance costs. The market has, has responded, but really what they've done is they've pushed that cost onto the consumer. Um, and that's really hard to do um, because a family of four with an income of $50,000 a year is already spending 15% of that income on healthcare. How much more can, you know, 
folks like you and I continue to bear bear the burden of that. Um, out of pocket expenses have tripled in the last five years, and healthcare spending is going to be over thirteen percent of GDP predicted by twenty ninety. So that's again setting the stage. This market is so ripe for really smart people um, to step in and and help get to things, help solve this crisis. The other thing that I think is is very important as we look towards um, this market is that being a patient does not equal being a consumer. It's a very weird universe that healthcare sits in. Um, this is is really in other industries. This is not acceptable, right? In every sense of what I go about my day in, I'm a consumer, right? Uh, with my cable company, with my grocery store, with my bank, right? Um, you know, healthcare can hide costs, but they're not accountable for the outcomes. I call this the. I guess it's just be glad you're alive. You know, that's supposed to be the bar and it's supposed to be good enough, right, um, to qualify and quantify the services that we get from our healthcare providers. And I'm not here, this is not a doctor bashing type of conversation. We have wonderful people in healthcare and they're using the tools that they have. Um, the real issue is that those tools are very outdated and they need to be tossed in the recycle been, and we need to bring fresh tools with fresh technology um, for them to be able to use. And so that's really um, kind of the conversation uh, that we're having today. And I think the other thing to, to think about is that hospitals, physicians, um, medical groups, there's really little um, published and little input taken by the consumer in terms of patient satisfaction scores. Our organization uses NPS as, you know, a customer service metric. Um, that sort of uh, satisfaction score, survey score, just doesn't really exist inside of healthcare. And so that's something that um, I think needs to change and should change in order to validate some of the expense and the costs of treatment. So this is my juicy slide, right? This is where we get to talk about where the applications will will sit. Um, we have a lot of artificial intelligence all over healthcare, really. But it's behind the scenes. Um, it's not at a consumer-facing level yet. Um, Watson has been uh, an IBM program that's been deployed by the Blue Cross Blue Shield programs and various carriers uh, dating back to 2011, right? It's been analyzing claims data. It's been machine learning practice patterns and looking at um, identifying chronic disease early. My Apple Watch, right? Um, wearables. There's been a huge uptick in wearables, and it gives me a little information, but we know that there's a lot more to come in terms of making artificial intelligence um, help and, and, um, encourage people to stay healthy or get healthy. Um, we see it in genetic testing and the ability to use artificial intelligence in some of that, which is very helpful in the treatment of cancer and certain disease, um, as well as in the pharmacy space to understand your proclivity for certain medications. Um, we see it in data engines that I, as an employee benefits consultant, gets to use with claims data, Artemis, Springbuck, um, Deerwalk, and there are really good systems out there that are starting to use machine learning to look at gaps in care, um, to look at information that physicians can't even get to because they're just sitting on the, in that physician bubble. They don't have the ability to look at all of the claims data. Um, so I think the issue is that we've got AI and AI is being developed and being used in kind of this practice pattern machine learning. So it's kind of, it's there and it's getting better, but now it's kind of stuck. We really haven't gotten it into the hands of the people that need it, you and I, as well as the physicians and the healthcare practitioners that we work with. So what does the future look like and why will these items 
bring down the cost of healthcare, which is really the topic of today's conversation, right? Um, improved physician care patterns, right? Imagine if your cardiologist could input your personal health information and your issues surrounding your heart. Let's assume you have a heart condition, right? Let's start there, right? Your cardiologist could consult with physicians all over the world and in specialty heart hospitals, right, to help uh, him or her maybe better understand or better treat you as, as an individual and as a patient. Wow. Um, not only would that be probably, you know, better, but it's probably going to be more cost effective and faster, right? So imagine a world where that exists, where you can consult globally with specialists in those spaces. Let's talk about increased virtual care and options, not just for the runny nose, but for other conditions. We're starting to see that happen with virtual care broadening uh, the conditions that they can work with. But what if my smartphone was even smarter and the lenses and the cameras that the physicians use could actually see things like optometrists can see um, when they're doing an eye exam so they can diagnose high blood pressure. Um, there are so many cool things that with uh, glass and lens technology that I think will enhance virtual care. And why is that important? Because in office care right now is twice uh, the cost of a virtual visit. If we could treat more things virtually, the overall cost of care would come down. And I believe that people would be more likely to seek care before something becomes a larger, more expensive disease or condition to treat. Um, so that's the reason that that will um, bring costs down. Identifying chronic disease early um, and quickly. If somebody through the claims data is identifying as a potential uh, chronic disease uh, individual, high blood pressure, right, diabetes, getting that information to the individual as quickly as possible and their doctors, super important. We're, we have systems now that can see that. I can look at some of my clients that I work with and through some of my partners identify already based on certain prescriptions that have been coming through the system that this person is likely a diabetic, although maybe they haven't seen um, an endocrinologist yet for that particular treatment. Wouldn't that be great to get that information as soon as possible to that individual so they can start managing that before it becomes uh, an issue where it's out of control and they have a hospital claim um, or a major illness because of it? Um, so we have the ability to do that. But again, it's stuck. It's stuck in this world of data, but not actionable data. It's not getting to the people that actually need it. I think customer experience input inputs uh, to health insurance carriers shaping plan options. Our health insurance options are outdated. They're old plan designs that aren't really speaking to the needs of consumers today. I think revamping how we think about insurance um, is going to be really important. And I think a lot of the learning that comes from the uh, artificial intelligence, the machine learning, the, the treatment patterns, the practice patterns, the best in class will help insurance carriers develop product that's actually more meaningful and more cost effective for um, employers. And then you and I in terms of being individual users. The pharmacies, I think we're getting there, but pharmacies way out of whack. We know it. It's now 25% of your insurance uh, monthly rate. Um, we're getting really good in that space. We've got disease reversing medications right now. Um, but because of issues with the United States, the cost of research and development, getting drugs to market, um, there is such an investment uh, that the pharmaceutical companies make that they want to recoup. Um, it's it's just becoming almost cost prohibitive to reduce pricing. However, I think that we'll see AI um, help our pharmaceutical companies uh, develop drugs more quickly uh, with less manpower in terms of the R&D that's needed. And so we will see that help 
I think we'll see it help in overprescribing um, and and predictively prescribing the right medications, helping to um, bring down some of our uh, dependency on drugs. Robotic assisted procedures definitely go there. I think that hospitals will be able to lower their overhead if they don't have to employ all of these specialists for themselves. If a hospital can count on a physician, um, I'm sitting here on the West Coast, but if uh, if uh, I can deploy a hospital or a physician on the East Coast to help robotically repair uh, a torn ligament or go in for heart surgery, how super cool is that? And it's it's a lower cost because again, they can they don't have to have that individual in their facility. It can be handled virtually. Um, just administratively alone. Well, the last time that you went to a doctor's office, think about all the forms you had to fill out. Like, this is ridiculous. Jim was talking about the flood application insurance, and it's it's two pieces of information and click, you're done. There's no reason why we cannot bring that sort of experience to um, physicians and hospitals' offices. We have to get rid of this administrative, fill out the form, I'll call it crap, um, Optum last year reported that there'd be $200 billion in savings in healthcare if we just didn't have to use pen and paper. So you can see that the future um, for artificial intelligence in healthcare is really exciting. And the reason that I'm passionate about that, and for all of you out there in this business, um, is bring it and bring it fast um, and bring it to the consumer. Um, I am really looking forward to the day where a lot of our telephone calls with the individual companies and their employees that I serve are happy calls. They're not calls around how frustrated they are, how they're not getting appropriate care, and how expensive it is. Um, so that's that's really where um, I'm sitting today. And I think we're just beginning this journey. Um, and I'm super excited about what the future holds um, for artificial intelligence and its application to this crazy world of healthcare here in the United States and globally. That's what I've got today for you. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you show the last okay, the last slide of yours so that people the, can have the, information about you? Yes. Sure. Is the last is the last slide showing here now? No. no. Well, it will be in. Hold on. Um, okay. Let me do that slideshow from current. In the meanwhile, and guys, if you have any questions, just type in the chat box, which is in the right side of your Q and A section. My uh, technology is not working well either, <laughs> the team. But, but just no, go to our, you could just go to our website. I'm all over LinkedIn. I'm happy to okay. connect with you there. Um, certainly through our website, you can find more information about our organization and what we do. Sure. So thank sure, you for your time thank today. You. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you for the exciting talk and giving us a lot of data which can serve us insight of how healthcare industries and insurance is moving about and what is in the future. So you have shown a figure till 2090. I'm not sure who will be alive at that. <laughs> but yeah, lovely one. Thank you. So guys, we'll move on to our next presenter now. So we have uh, Ben Liu, who's from Penn Mutual. And his topic is real-world AI applications in life insurance. So, Ben, can we have you on stage? You can share your presentation and we can move. Yep. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Can you guys see my presentation here? Absolutely. Okay. So Thank you. I'm here to share some experience that we had last two years. As a small to medium-sized carrier, we were told that we don't have enough data. Uh, but the results seem to, you know, be quite promising. So that's why I would kind of share my experience with you guys. I thought it was very exciting. Uh, so uh, a little bit of background. I'm more of a, you know, I, I'm a, like an e econ major from UPenn. Uh, but, you know, I got into the computer business. I was a, you know, a architect in the integration space for a long time. But luckily, I got into life new, new business uh, space I was been doing for the last 12 years. Uh, some of them are uh, mostly, you know, system integrations, uh, client data, you know, medical vendor data. Part of that is the medical vendor data, which kind of helped me to kind of understand the prescription history, uh, a lot of the other stuff. 
So, and later on, we kind of engaged a kind of effort in 2018 to say, hey, you know, can we extract all the, our application data? Can we get the lab data from PDF, XML? Can we get the prescription history underwriter notes? And a lot of these stuff came from, you know, using AI convolution network to figure out, hey, is this uh, checkbox checked? What's this value uh, of BMI, height and weight, all the other stuff. We also read the labs very well uh, through a similar mechanism. We have the, you know, uh, digital recognition OCR based on AI, you know, because the old OCR technologies are going away. So part of that is really understanding life new business data and understanding the the day-to-day -day practice, right? So uh, my current position is Applied Innovation AVP. Uh, you know, so these are the, 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 um, the uh, four kind of, you know, the first one is really not a production system. It's just really reading underwriting notes, noted, knowing the rating systems. And part of the application of the nat natural language processing AI we apply with LSTM is that it reads the underwriter rating out of each underwriter notes. So for some cases when there is no final underwriting outcome, uh, you know, this really kind of provides a lot of label for later training. And then we kind of went through, you know, two model iterations of prescription history. The first one, you know, we tried about 23 uh, you know, RX code. Uh, it worked really well. It helped our, you know, existing A system. And then later on, we did the entire 540 some uh, HIC3 code models. Uh, I will get to the efficacy of these models. And then we evolved and we say, you know, we're going to do full un underwriting instead of using other people's engine. We're going to, you know, so, so we actually got that complete. Uh, technically, it's complete around August. But then we have the financial underwriting piece, which got plugged in later on. So it's about September 2020 when we have all these things ready. And prescription covering the full 500, we're also there. Uh, APS summarization, which we'll talk about a little bit. You know, we, we kind of got it done extraction-wise. It's really working well, and I can show you guys that. Our last piece is, you know, ICD underwriting. And this is really based on the information we get from the attending physician statements. Right, so I'm here just trying to share our experience and, and let pe people know that things are possible and some of the caveats, really nothing uh, more than that. So, you know, for, for prescription history, you know, the, the part of the big key is to understand the language because the, 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 there's a lot of information on the prescription, the doctor's specialty, you know, a lot of the, 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 the severe conditions, right, it is based on, you, you know, for, for example, I want to give you one particular example is that, you know, for motion sickness drug, most people thought it was really mild. And according to the reinsurance rule, those are, those are auto accepts, right? Turns out if they're from oncology, they're for chemotherapy relief. And, and interesting, interestingly, chemotherapy really doesn't have it in the record, in, you know, because it's in the hospital system, really, it doesn't really show up in the prescription data or any other medical data. It's only in the hospital systems. So it's very hard to figure out chemo if they're under the radar, but motion sickness drug will get you there, which is really funny. And the other one I want to point out is if people have podiatry prescribing antifungal diseases a lot, this person have diabetic uh, ulcers. So, so these are very interesting dynamics. Some of the things are correlated. Some of them are treatment relationships. But currently, the, the, uh, you know, the, the separation is supporting about 98 plus percent accuracy on full underwriting model. And, and plus, the, one of the ethics we follow is that we don't use any age or gender. Most of the time, you know, for certain drugs, especially related to you know, uh, I, I don't have, I forgot the drug's name, but it, it's really female would be really concerning, but we're not allowed to use it. That, that's the, you know, fundamental message. You know, we're worried about audits. We worry about, you know, people saying you're discriminating against, uh, you know, older generation or, or females or even male for that matter. So for fully auto, you know, autonomous underwriting, 
I was lucky enough to involve in the auto underwriting project for about two years. That's why I pick up these stuff. And then eventually, uh, you know, we use, we create this model and finished about September last year uh, using prescription history data, MIB, uh, motor vehicle report, and Lexus Nexus inspection report or risk classifier, if you will, right? Most, you know, rule engine can cover about low teens, uh, you know, accept ratio, meaning instantly rated by AI. The ratio is relatively low, right? Even with tuning, manual tuning by carriers, by other people, it reached in the low 20s. I think that that's when it maxed out. But the AI engine can accept about 40% of really healthy population, uh, 98.1% accuracy, uh, matching the final underwriting outcome. So that's a really large percentage of acceptance ratio, as well as the, the, the accuracy matching, matching the underwriter. We don't count uh, rating slippage, I mean, rating gains, just because if people are getting a, you know, if we're more uh, strict than the underwriter, most likely the person will walk away. But with disease like, you know, uh, oncology prescribing a, a anti, you know, motion sickness, we blocks it, but we assume the person never took it. So we don't count them as gains. We're only counting the downside, meaning when we rate them higher than the underwriter, we count them as slippage. So it's about 1.3% slippage rating wise. And we're basically saying, even if an AI make a mistake, it makes about one rating bucket mistake. It doesn't really go beyond that. Most likely, they, the, the, the human underwriter has more information. Uh, they, they kind of pick up the phone and, and call the, you know, the, the agent. And then the, it's a 39, 9K unseen samples as, as the validation set. So for the APS summarization, their you know attending physician statement, their image files, their their image file with you know handwritings and graphs were not. But AI can actually do a very good job figuring out the language, whether it's smoker, previous smoker, cigar smoker, or you know any, any social smoker. What's their BMI? What's the medical condition or family history in ICD tens? Uh, you know, most of the time, the, the, the APS won't have these codes ready for you. You really need to recognize the medical condition. So evaluated a solution from IBM, Cognizant, and a few other big techs. A lot of times, they bring a lot of extra information because they're reading a 160-page APS. They bring in, for example, you know, sneezing. He, he's having cold chills. Brings a lot of symptoms coming, a lot of noise, a lot of, also a lot of inaccuracy. So our own actuary kind of did a feedback, I mean, evaluation and said, well, we, we offer much better accuracy. In some instances, we tested about 100K samples. We had doubts about less than 3% of them. And, and that's really interesting because, you know, compared to the big tech solution, the summarization is really, you know, kind of trying to be the, 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 the standard. But we have much more information relevancy we don't bring in symptoms. We only bring in conditions that, you know, warrants attention as well as their ICD-10 codes. So part of the application for this is human can read an instance, instant available AI APS summarization. So a website, somebody can kind of see on the first page all the summary information as well as the key pages that you know, when AI pull these information. So the human can review it. Instead of pay up to $100 for APS summary and wait for 48 hours, you can actually get it instantaneously, right? The second piece is we want to get ready for ICD-10 underwriting. Part of that is the EHR is rising very, very quickly in the space. So we want to be ahead in the game in the, in the world of ICD underwriting and try to future-proof it. It's working progress. So I can't spoke about its efficacy. But those are the things that from our perspective is quite possible and in reality, which is quite exciting. Um, yeah, Ben, there's one question for you uh, right. from Alexander. Uh, can this set of algorithms be classified as supervised learning in terms of ML? 
Well, it's really supervised learning will, will cover certain aspect of it. But as I go on, I will kind of draw you to, to your attention to the small data problem. Small data problem is everywhere. So just use supervised learning. You're not going to get there. And you're going to use a bunch of, you know, combination of, of techniques. One of them is semi-supervised learning. So human would provide certain feedback loop, and then the, the learning, you know, iteratively gets better. And that's where the accuracy will come from. If you just use a, you know, a PhD, a use a cookie cutter solution out of school, you will find a lot of things cannot be, you know, se- they're not separable. But part of that is really, you know, figuring out wh- where that edge is going to come from, from each different method. Sure, you could carry on, yeah. All right, so I'm going to quickly run through this. This is just the, you know, stack. We use PyTorch, we use uh, CNN, we use Neural Network, which is the supervised learning. We also have unsupervised. And these are language, uh, you know, natural language processing uh, things we use, like LSTM, long-term, short-term memory, with attention, and SPACI with medical entity recognition, NLP plus BERT, right? Those are very good. The thing we figure out is that by nature, I'm a more of a modeler because I was a previously, you know, a, a, a computer architect. I'm really interested in design patterns and figure out models. I, I had some success there. But if you have to choose, you know, your, your subject matter expert, underwriter, and actuary, data scientist, and modeler, what we figure out is that most of the time, you're not going to find that unicorn with all three skills. The idea is most likely you want actually to learn data science and you want a modeler to learn data science so they can complement each other. With most academia, you know, people, they're really good at easy, uh, you, you know, solutions, meaning if you have, you know, sufficient amount of data, they're all available. So it's really like, you know, the model hypothesis is really the, the key to figure out, hey, what data do you have? And what's the, the thing, scope of learning? And what's the target you're trying to separate? If you're going to try to separate diabetic, you know, whether it's table three or table eight, right? Uh, rating in the underwriting world, well, they're substandard. It's very difficult unless you have very detailed metric on their measuring as well as prescription. You know, other people have tried to kind of say, I'm going to do an Uber model that solves everything, which is impossible. You really want to figure out what's separable, what's not separable, and then evaluate your data set and say, how, how much data I have? How much is reasonable for, for teaching a child? Because I don't really think the child can learn everything. You know, for example, one of the particular language learning we have is one particular model is learning the, the character sequence of an APS line and try to say, hey, this is most closely to this disease description. The other one is pre-trained model based on BERT and learning on the semantic meaning of this word, chronic sinusitis. So, so those are different experts. You, you really want to know which each model's strengths and, and detriments are going to be at and figure out how to separate them. And that's really the fun part of, about modeling is trying to understand your subject matter. Because I think one of the APS you know, performance boosts we got is really from our understanding APS better than anybody else. Not about we have be- better AI you know, from these big techs, whether it's IBM or, or Cognizant, which is really unlikely. Okay. So, but also one thing I would say is also try to be iterative. Do not try to find this perfect uh, modeling concept. Try to do iterative approach and, and then go back to the teaching child philosophy and understand if a child is making a mistake, we don't blame the child. We really want to go back and say, what are we teaching the child? Do we have enough data? Do, should we changing a different mechanism to teach a different child? Right, because if, if the neural network or supervised learning is not picking up and, and give you a, a range of, uh, uh, of scores, it's not helping you, then it's the wrong method, right? So you just really need to be creative and figure out. So iterative is really the approach. Every time you do one AI model, you learn more things. 
it's almost like a whole new Pandora, I mean, you know, uh, Pandora box opened up once you kind of evaluate the results and figure out what the model is and what the data is saying. And, and, and you know what to, what to do. Maybe, you know, give the child more books by injection, you know, of more data or more information. The math is there. You just need to figure out what can be handled by AI, what cannot be. So iterative is the best thing. You can keep tweaking your hypotheses. Uh, NLP is essential for accuracy these days. Think about the APS. Think about the prescription report with doctor's uh, specialty and any other, you know, information about, uh, you know, dosage and whatnot, right? So, and then knowledge inje injection in, in this case is really important. Is really, you know, for example, we, for, for us to understand things that Amazon do, do not have an answer. So Amazon say, hey, I gave up on recognizing this, this disease, right? So what we do is the NLP will come in and say, well, most likely with the pre-training model on PubMed data, meaning um, bioscience data, right? It will really figure out, hey, this one is really close to this term. And they turned out to be the same, right? So it's really interesting that the knowledge injection there are a lot of pre-trained models out there. You just got to figure out what, for your specific, you know, scope or, or separable targets, what are you trying to shoot for? And, and that really helps you. And the other part is once you have the feedback loop going, you can do this human in the loop uh, labeling. Recently, that's one of the, you know, a conference publication submission I made with a bunch of PhD uh, students. So one of the subject is really talking about human in the loop labeling and how to make your, you know, supervised learning more efficient, not only, you know, when, when to use supervised learning, but when you use it, make sure the label is small label. It's not something that, you know, really just, it's there, I use it. If I don't have it, you know, that, that's it kind of thing. So that's really the, the key to the success, to find your secret ingredients. I'm sure... You know, there's so many smart actuaries, you know, in, in, in this conference. I'm sure plenty of people will find their own discoveries and success, All right? So my prediction, it's a short presentation, so I'm trying to keep everything short. Uh, so, so my prediction of EHR, a future of underwriting is EHR on the rise, so you need ICD-10. You need to figure out low risk and, and high risk ICDs and do underwriting, but mortality score or trying to figure out diabetic table three versus table, uh, between table three and eight, that's going to be very tricky. I don't think with, with the amount of data and the detail level of data we have, it, it's going to be feasible. But AI underwriting, maybe with human supervision, it's really because of, you know, uh, from, from, a, a, you know, from, a, from, a, audit perspective, from the supervising body perspective, they may not feel super comfortable. Are you using discriminatory practice in your AI? And finally, medical claims data with CPT uh, codes with uh, prescription data in the medical claims data. They're very interesting. They have procedures. They have each day visits specific condition codes. So you can go into the details of each doctor visit if a human like to drill into that you know, particular encounter. Finally, it's a reduced re medical requirement because if you can say 40% of people are, you know, uh, healthy, there's really no point to spend the $100 on the, on the medical exam. So I'm actually reaching the end. I just figured that out. So any questions? Yeah, so there's one question uh, by Alexander. Is it closer to a set of heuristic model rather than a generalized model set? Well, I think the heuristic model or, or multivariate approach we take, we originally tried on, on a mortality score uh, model front has not been very fruitful. So what I'm trying to say is that each model need to, you know, be decided at, at how much data. But ideally, I would use supervised learning or unsupervised learning and looking at one area at a time. Because overarchingly, if you're trying to find a uh, you know, massive 9 million patient data, 
which cover all data points, it's going to be very difficult. You're going to have to figure out you have a small data problem in certain prescription area or other areas and then break them down into smaller areas. I don't know if that answered the question. Sure. Thank you, Alex. Anyways, uh, can we have all the panelists also uh, bring up on stage? Uh, Robert, Misha, Hari, Miala, Alexander, Peter. In the meanwhile, anyone, any one of you have any questions uh, apart from what Alex asked? Hello? Yeah. Okay, Ben, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, lovely presentation and showing the insight of, of uh, real world AI applications in the life insurance industry. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Sure, thanks. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah, so we have a great set of panelists now with us. So, uh, guys, before we move on to the panel discussion, just to let you know, we are exactly on time. It's 10.30, 10.31 now. So let's start the discussion so that we are on time. We have around an hour's time for this. So obviously the agenda is what will be the future of AI or emerging technology for the insurance industry. So we have the panel members. Robert is the moderator. Misha is there. Hari Krishan is there. Mihala is there. Alexander is there. Peter is there. So I'll hand it over to Robert. And let's have an excellent panel discussion for an hour's time. Thank you. Over to you. Nitin, thank you very much. Can you hear me OK? okay. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you so much, and uh, everybody, thank you for joining our panel discussion. We're going to talk today about the future of AI in the insurance sector. I'm going to start by giving everyone in our audience some introductions for uh, my panelists. I want to tell you right now, you've got a very diverse group of panelists who are, who are experts in, in their industry, and I'm very glad to be able to, to moderate this session. I think we're going to learn a whole lot. So. Um, you know, let's let's jump right into it. I'm going to go through the panelists and uh, all if, if I've not given sufficient detail about your background, please feel free to add more when we get into it. Um, <clears throat> Misha Blameyer Ferris is the founder of Etymology Consulting. The majority of Misha's 20 year career has taken place in the insurance industry and her roles where they started in sales and marketing. She shifted into operations with a focus on efficiency and process improvement and eventually moved to technology. Misha has built and led sales teams, consulted for some of the world's largest retail brands, and guided organizations on their digital transformations, partnered with the world's largest CRM organization, and been head of technology while disrupting an insurance sector in the U.S. Misha, thanks so much for coming. Alex Bykovsky is an experienced director with demonstrated history of working in the insurance and investment banking industries. Alex has strong professional skills in data science, data architecture, economics, exotic valuation, structured finance, securities, asset management, team building, and retirement planning. Thank you, Alex, for joining us. Uh, Mahela Capra is the Assistant Vice President of Digital Innovation at Sun Life. In this role, Mahela leads the digital transformation of the risk management function through three pillars, risk technology, data management, and governance and advanced analytics. In a prior role, Mahela led the risk management function for models and analytics used in the enterprise. Other of Mihaela's roles include asset management, audit, and media. Mihaela has a master's degree in mathematical finance and computing science and in applied statistics. And in her spare time, she volunteers for causes that are close to her interests, such as for PRMIA to advance the risk management profession and for the United Way to help the most vulnerable in our society. Mihaela, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, thank you. Next, I have with me Peter Nadell. Peter is the manager of corporate insurance at First Energy. Peter's worked in the insurance discipline for over 20 years, spending the last six years as the manager of corporate insurance for First Energy, a Fortune 500 electric utility. Pete is among active utility insurance advisory committees and is a frequent speaker at industry events. Peter, thank you for joining us. Happy to be here. Thank Next, I have Hari Krishnan Pillai. Hari is the AVP of Data Analytics and Insights and Business Delivery at Sun Life. 
Uh, Peter has spent, or Hari has spent time at Invesco in Canada, 18 years leading digital and data analytics transformation in asset management with a global investment manager. Hari also has experience at Deloitte and NCR and GIS Technologists, developing various mapping solutions using geographic information system software. Hari, thank you so much for joining us today. And finally, my name is Robert Eaton. Uh, I'm a fellow of the Society of Actuaries. I'm a member of the American Academy of Actuaries, and I'm a life and long-term care insurance actuary. Uh, I'm a principal with uh, Milliman, and I'm a consultant in our Tampa, Florida office. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Love Actuary. I'm on the board of directors of the Society of Actuaries, and I'm the former president and CEO of the Intercompany Long-Term Care Insurance Conference back in 2021. I'm really thrilled to be here on this panel. I think this is a super important topic. Uh, I'm going to tee up the topic and then I'm going to start throwing questions to our panelists and, and get some of their insights right away. You know, in my view, artificial intelligence is still in its nascent stages. I think we are at the beginning of a large revolution of machine learning and the ability of machines and algorithms to shape the way we do our daily lives and business, uh, including in insurance, which we're all familiar with. You know, AI stands to impact most business sectors, but insurance, I see AI impacting every single piece of the value chain. In insurance, we talk about the value chain of customer acquisition, of underwriting, of in-force management and data analytics, understanding our customer, of claims adjudication, of benefit payments, and we also have reinsurance in third-party markets uh, where we do business with other, um, other companies. <clears throat> so, you know, starting at the beginning of that value chain, I have a question, I think probably from Misha, you know, what does AI really do for the customer experience? Can you, can you tell us a little bit more about that from your perspective, Misha? Absolutely. Can you hear me okay, Robert? Yes. Wonderful. Awesome. Yeah, I think the a customer experience is a really interesting way to start off, right? Because I think when we Think about data and we think or when we're thinking about AI, we think, is it even relatable to customer experience? And the answer is absolutely. You know, customer voice is really driven by customer choice and customer behavior and knowing who and how those consumers want to be digitally engaged or not digitally engaged is really imperative. I think, you know, trust, you know, trusting that data leads um, really leads to confident decisions or thinking about it from the right action at the right time. Ultimately, that engaging customer experience is what keeps them coming back for more. You know, if we can better serve our customers, we gain that competitive edge in the marketplace. So I really do think that data integrity is such a is such a business imperative. And I really do think that data needs to be accurate and, the, and it's consistent and framed with the right context, especially as it relates to our customer experience. Yeah, I think that's a great point. We see insurance kind of sold and in, in new in various ways. And, uh, you know, we also see interaction with uh, with insurance companies, you know, throughout the lifetime of a product in, in new and different ways, you know, digitally, uh, but also uh, kind of more uh, more intelligent touch points, I think, than we've seen previously. Um, you know, I also wonder uh, about the application of artificial intelligence for insurance companies. You know, when it comes to predicting loss probabilities. Um, you know, and and Alex, you and I had exchanged some notes. Maybe you can tell me from your perspective how you know among that value chain I mentioned. How do you see AI really transforming insurance? I mean, from my uh, perspective, and again, it's, uh, you know, I'm kind of siloed because uh, the doctor's company exclusively does medical malpractice. Um, and we, uh, we actually have a model that heavily relies on human decision making um, because we are, you know, we, we do ensure those risks for um, the bulk of our clients, which are um, hospitals and uh, and uh, private practices, so uh, some of those uh, some of the ratings uh, rating of those risks can be greatly improved um, by even a simple implementation of the most basic machine learning and uh, AI techniques. Um, the biggest challenge in, uh, in in terms of implementing that is that um, you know people uh, at the at at the top in management have uh, um, 
you know, gotten used to doing things a certain way. And especially when the dollar amounts are relatively high, um, they are not comfortable with change. So a lot of it comes down to education and, um, you know, just um, go, going through the, uh, the studies with, the, um, you know, with, the, with upper management about how um, this can be effective. But, um, you know, even, even simple um, natural language processing techniques uh, would be a huge improvement um, in terms of uh, risk rating, um, at least, uh, you know, in, in my side of PNC. You raised some really interesting questions. Um, you know, here, at, maybe at the advent of, of artificial intelligence in the insurance industry, um, I think so much of what we need to do as as leaders in in this industry is to communicate well and to educate. Um, you know, some of us are kind of uh, growing up with uh, with this new technology. Uh, I'll give an example from. Um, from my perspective, uh, you know, working with the Society of Actuaries, we've had to change the exam material um, dramatically over the past five, ten years in order to accommodate, uh, you know, new skills, um, new ways to communicate uh, from, you know, from actuary to senior management, uh, new ways to describe the modeling that we're doing. Explainable artificial intelligence is, is very tough. It's not easy at all. And, you um, to be able to uh, to be able to actually uh, understand what goes on in some of these models, to be able to communicate that to the stakeholders in your various uh, lines of work is is really important. So, uh, fully fully appreciate that, Alex. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I wanted to uh, to turn to Mahela for a second. You know, Mahela, you and I uh, exchanged some emails. You know, I want I want to understand a little bit more. How does how does your experience relate to uh, the AI field, you know, from a, a risk uh, practitioner perspective? What, what can you share with us? Oh, definitely. Uh, thank you, uh, Robert. Uh, as, as you mentioned earlier, my past roles have been related to modeling and model governance. Um, more recently, I have led the efforts of creating a risk governance framework for identifying, mitigating, managing, and monitoring all the heightened risks uh, that come with the usage of AI in insurance, and many of the speakers before uh, have pointed to some of them. Uh, in my current role, I did switch sides, so I'm responsible for the adoption of AI in, in risk management, so development, delivery of a pipeline of use cases for various uh, risk uh, management areas. And seeing the two sides of the coin gave me a quite uh, unique perspective, uh, a better understanding what matters for the business. Uh, we understand that the, uh, the governance or the requirements, uh, the, the ability to educate, the ability to make AI um, transparent, it's uh, all those are very, very difficult, uh, time consuming, um, uh, not easy to grasp and, and just just seeing the two sides of the coin gave me an idea, a better idea, what's feasible, what's realistic, where the real help with governance should be provided to the to the business, the first line that really needs AI to advance their business uh, objectives. I, th I think that's pretty fascinating. You know, we're we're approaching this from from different perspectives. Mihaela at a, at a large company, um, Alex. Uh, from a medical malpractice perspective, uh, Misha, uh, from your experience as a consultant and also your background in, in other insurance sectors, um, you know, I, I'm I'm hearing uh, I'm hearing you know interesting perspectives on on model governance, on new problems to approach, on on communication. Um, let's let's turn for a second to uh, to commercial insurance. Maybe Peter, uh, you know, as a commercial insurance purchaser. You know, tell me about your experience. What are your expectations, you know, as AI continues to uh, evolve in the insurance industry? Thanks, Robert. I'll say that my expectations are growing with each one of these uh, interesting panel uh, speakers and, and interesting presentations. It's uh, very obvious that we're on the, the precipice of doing some really great things. Uh, there's, there's a couple different areas that where I think we can really start to see uh, improvements for, for us as a consumer 
one of the areas that we're that we're really struggling with because it's very labor intensive is uh, tracking certificates of insurance. Contractual risk transfer is a big part of our business. We have a lot of uh, vendors that we have to use, and, and our business, being an electric utility, is, is inherently dangerous. Uh, it's inherently dangerous for our employees. It's also inherently dangerous for the public and our consumers. So we need to make sure that we're, we're beyond the safety aspect of it, which is which is our number one concern, that in the event something happens, we have the ability to transfer that. And so tracking those certificates of insurance can be quite cumbersome and, and very labor intensive. Uh, so I, I think Samil had, had spoken about it a little bit earlier that there, there are things that can be done with just basic rule based learning and the ability. We all use the same accord form. Uh, so the ability to get that information into a system based on what our expectations are from those vendors should be a, a big lift for us to be able to remove from our own uh, you know, the manual upload of those things and really allow us to focus on those areas that could possibly um, be a problem, be problematic or, or be variances outside of what our expectations are. So I think in the short term, that's something that's that's near term and can really be beneficial to everyone in the insurance industry. Um, specific to the electric utility and utility industry in general, we, we have the advantage of having very large industry mutual insurers that provide our coverage for us. And as the expectations have grown for, from us as, as their number one consumers, we realize that they have, because they in, uh, insure most of the utility industry in North America, they have vast amounts of data. And as Samuel had pointed this out in his presentation earlier, that we're very data rich, but information poor. And so what our expectations are going forward is how are we able to start analyzing that data to really influence the, the entire industry and help that safety aspect that's number one? Our, our main goal isn't to uh, remediate incidents once they've happened, it's to prevent them from happening. And as we can use that data to get better at that, it's very helpful if some of the other utilities that may be in different areas and have experienced things um, may be able to share that information to help get to root causes and help identify issues before they happen and help us to, to remediate that. That's a really interesting, interesting perspective. I'm, I'm picking up some similarities between work that, uh, that I do and work that, that you do, uh, Peter, and that is, you know, there are kind of known risks out there. Insurance companies, uh, you know, cover these known risks. And the question is, um, you know, in, in some sense, how can we get a better understanding of those? What analytics might we want to know today, maybe that we couldn't know 5, 10, 15 years ago? Uh, you know, understanding uh, what AI machine learning uh, can, can bring us, uh, what insights can we learn uh, to better anticipate those risks and maybe kind of, kind of shrink the field of uncertainty around them. Uh, I think that's probably something that's common to, to most of our lines of business. So I, I definitely, uh, it's really interesting, uh, Peter, to hear you talk about this from a utility perspective. That's that's kind of fascinating. Um, you know, I want to I want to turn to uh, to Hari on our panel. Uh, Hari, can you tell me, you know, in your role um, at at uh, as a AVP of, of analytics, you know, what business outcomes are, are you trying to achieve? Can you give us a little bit of, of your personal perspective? Yeah, no problem. Happy to. So I work for a distribution channel within uh, within Sun Life, and uh, here what we are trying to do is create a hybrid advice experience, right? So you have the digital data and human advisor, which is which is pretty pretty innovative from one perspective because we are trying to bring in health, wealth, and uh, health and wellness, all those things under one umbrella, right? So so it is pretty interesting from that perspective. And uh, so our data analytics use cases revolves around four themes, right? Four business outcomes. One is elevate the client experience. So when I talk about clients, we have the external clients and our, also our internal advisors, right? That is servicing the client. So we want to enhance that client experience. Number two is we are we have to 
have an eye on the revenue, right? Increasing the revenue. So do we, we make sure we are providing the right experience for the clients and that create a halo effect into our products and solutions. So that's about increasing revenue. Then the other two aspects is reducing cost and reducing risk. Reducing cost means some of those mundane repeated process that's been traditionally happening in F-150 year old insurance company. We want to automate certain things, right? That is uh, that we can make sure we are maximizing the human capital element. And the last but not the least, uh, reducing risk, right? So we still work in a highly regulatory environment. Um, and uh, and uh, and we got to make sure some of our call calls uh, from advisory perspective, it's all compliant. And that's where we are trying to use NLP and uh, translate that into speech to text, all that capabilities to make sure we are not providing, uh, we are following a structure to the calls and making sure it's not, we are providing the right, right advice and fiduciary guidance to the client. So, so those are the four business outcomes, like ele elevating client experience, increasing revenue, reducing cost and reducing risk. I, I, love, I love how you phrased it. Uh, you said reducing costs, finally, but it, it, earlier on you said maximizing kind of human capital. I think that's that's probably my my favorite way to kind of position using um, more AI. But it has it has all of these functions. Um, you know the the improvements in technology that we've seen in the past five or ten years. Uh, you know, starting with starting with the uh, efficiency of just being able to meet like this in a, in a video conference call. This doesn't involve any particularly special AI. It's just an example of one of the emerging technologies that allows our insurance business to to operate a lot more fluidly. Uh, so I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Um, I've heard a couple of people talk about how natural language processing is in, impacting their business. Um, maybe maybe let's pick up on that thread a little more. Alex uh, or Hari, do you want to talk maybe a little deeper about um, how you use NLP in, in your business and, and where you see kind of the future of that? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, we you, we use it in, uh, in the rating of risks. Um, you know, our underwriters have these questionnaires with literally hundreds of questions because we're a very tailored industry. So um, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, questionnaires, since, you know, especially uh, these days, the doctors are extremely busy, um, uh, is self-report. So, um, you know, you, you're not always going to sit with your agent um, or your broker and and fill that out. So we're actually getting um, a higher set of validity um, over the past year, year and a half um, coming from uh, those primary sources. Um, and, you know, it's been making some of our um, underwriting and our risk control a little bit tighter. Um, other than that, um, it's one of the most developed um, set of algorithms out there. Um, you know, and it's, uh, uh, there's a lot of use cases, especially from, uh, places like Google and Facebook. Uh, but that's a little bit, uh, advanced at least, you know, um, for, for where my industry is, uh, maybe, um, you know, some of the other lines, um, are probably going to have a, uh, easier time implementing it. Yeah. So just to add to that, in our case, the use case from a distribution perspective that's coming across is the client might start a call with the advisor from an insurance perspective, right? You know, so they need a life insurance. It's, it could be a term life insurance or it could be a permanent life insurance, right? And uh, that call can pivot to a wealth conversation very quickly, right? You know, because they have some unmet needs within their household. And after some time, and I listen to many, many calls of that, and sometimes it can pivot to, oh, I need to have a disability insurance because what happens if, uh, if I get injured? What happens to my family, right? All these calls, you need to have consent of the clients and uh, certain type of needs analysis questions that could be different, right? So understanding those unstructured data, right, you know, in the, in the form of the calls and translating that to almost like a structured data, right, you know, speech to text and all that stuff, right, is extremely important from a compliance perspective, right? So at some point, we have a compliance audit and make sure all our calls are pretty 
pretty compliant. And I think we, we should have like a tangible data to support this, right? So we have, we, we, we are just starting off that, you know, and we are doing a lot of some of the POCs, but we haven't, uh, but that's one area when we think about the themes that I talked about, uh, it's the, reducing risk team, right? We got to make sure uh, this is, uh, th that is embedded within our practice. Yeah, I, thank you both for those perspectives. That's, you're actually, you're actually kind of jogging something in, in my mind. I know that the, uh, the NAIC, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners here in the U.S. put out, I think it was a, a paper about last August, and it was the six pillars of, of like the ethical use of, of AI. And, um, you know, that that leads me to ask, you know, what are some of the data considerations that you all have? Um, you know, Mihaela, you and I talked a little bit um, uh, over email and, and Bisha, you and I uh, also corresponded about, you know, use of data. So I'd wonder, I'd, I'd like to get this panelist's perspective on what are the considerations you have with the influx of, of massive data? Maybe I'll start with Misha, then go to Mihaela. Um, and, and of course, any others welcome to chime in. But Misha, tell me about your experience, um, you know, understanding your clients' data in, in regards to AI. Yes, absolutely. Can you hear me okay, Robert? Great. So, you know, when we think about, when we, you know, think about data, right, when we think about um, what has AI looked like over the past couple decades, right? Um, you know, a lot of companies over the last few decades have hired those teams of scientists to build out the models and look at the trends and the characteristics. And a lot of companies still do that today. But then we saw a shift, right? There was a big focus on that data warehouse, uh, the data lake, right? And we get a lot of questions around if I have all of this data and and or I still and I still have that team of scientists or I want that team of scientists. Do I even need AI? And the answer is absolutely right. Artificial intelligence and machine learning has certainly proven it can boost automation and production. But for a visual for a moment, let's think about data as this massive ocean. Right. And AI is that navigator and that data needs to be accurate and it needs to be consistent and it needs to be framed in the right context. And so you can imagine now coming into, you know, 2021 and 2022, right? You have that the power of marrying that data with science and now AI. And, you know, we are we are positioned for great success. And I think, um, you know, data is still so important, but you really need AI to be that navigator. I think that makes a lot of I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, Mihaela, from, you know, a risk manager's perspective, tell me how, you know, you're you're viewing your use of data, uh, either the ethical and responsible responsible uses thereof or uh, if you have any other kind of considerations you want to elevate for the panel. Yes. Yes, I, I, I agree with, with the last point uh, that Misha may, made. Uh, we are getting more and more data. We are getting data uh, in life insurance from uh, life and health insurance from wearables. We, we are exposed to a significant amount of data. We need something to put order in the data. Uh, and that's the navigator. I really like that one. Um, the, and the AI is the only way to to understand and and uh, find patterns and use the data for for some uh, uh for some purposes from a risk perspective uh though uh the first thing we do is how we use the data uh, um, uh, we are looking at um, regulatory requirements uh we are looking at who is responsible for uh the errors and failure and uh Part of the errors and failures do come from the data side, do come from the data quality, from the way the data is being used, for the, the way the data was being transformed into features. So just to think about um, processing uh, sp uh, spe speech uh, uh, or speech recognition, using speech recognition algorithms, those algorithms, um, you know, they can identify uh, uh, underlying patterns uh, across uh, various types of uh, groups, uh, ethnic groups, uh, race, etc. Uh, how are we able to use that such that our uh, transformed data that becomes input data into new models and new and additional AI uh, that is not um, 
biased to begin with. So that's some of the concerns. Um, for example, in, in Canada um, and in general, the life insurance uh, industry uses many personal data points uh, like age and gender. Uh, the actuarial tables are built on those and that's legal usage. Uh, but is this still okay if we use that in in an AI, in a, in a powerful algorithm, in something that self-learns uh, and evolves? Um, and, and that raises even more questions. Uh, what do we need to add to our current data governance uh, uh, approaches so we, we identify and take care of those additional aspects of concern? Um, Regulation-wise, in, in Canada, we have uh, PIPEDA, a... Uh, uh, privacy regulation for many, many years um, in place. We are comfortable with it. But currently, there is uh, the C11 bill in the parliament proposing changes to PIPEDA just to, to uh, tackle uh, the usage of data uh, and the privacy risk uh, when data is used by AIs. So all those aspects are the core of our, uh, our, of our work in risk management. And uh, I, they many times they sound as um, deterrent uh, uh, to uh, innovation. Uh, but obviously we all, all, all try to, to, uh, to do innovation with care. So, so, so the results that we are getting to the, are sustainable in the long term and do not expose us as organization to additional risks. It's a it's a really great point. You know, we uh, we often uh, you know we know that we can do something. Uh, we do have this technology, but we we need to stop back, step back, and, and ask ourselves, you know, should we be doing this? Uh, it, you know, it's a question that I you know I think uh, we've we've run afoul of uh, in in other sectors in the past. So um, definitely uh, appreciate that point, uh, Mahela, about that about that caution. Um, I do wanna I do wanna look over to um, Look over to the uh, the energy or the electric utility uh, space and, and ask you know Peter um, you know do any of these data concerns you know we're talking with um, with with Misha Mahela myself I'm a, I'm a life and health actuary we're talking about actual people I think we get a sense that you know data about people themselves you know there's some kind of proprietary nature to that and we need to tread really softly um, tell me about your experience Peter you know what uh, analytics, um, you know, uh, do you think that, you know, would improve data in your space? What data analytics would improve your own line of business as well as, you know, what, what considerations do you have about the, the data that you can get? Um, tell, tell us uh, your perspective. Yeah, thanks. That, that, that's an interesting uh, perspective for, for us. And, and certainly customer data is, is always at the forefront of uh, our, our protective schemes. But we need to give the same consideration for the insurance data because a lot of times that has to do with the public who may or may not be customers in, in the same traditional sense. Uh, you, you could be being served by a, a certain electric utility but have uh, an incident with, with another. So uh, crossing that over can be some, somewhat precarious. But in the same vein, uh, as I've been speaking, the safety is the, is the number one concern. So as we are looking at data, I think we can do it in a way that's anonymous enough, but give us the ability to uh, more centralize our education. As, as we're talking to our customers and, and to the public in general, education is, is one of the number one items that we can use in order to help avoidance of, of further accidents or, or at least mitigate some of the effects of, of what can happen if there's an interaction with uh, the electrical system. So getting some of that data so we can focus that education and learning uh, to, to specific at-risk populations, whether it's via demographics, geographic location, uh, even stuff as simple as a type of system or type of apparatus that may be more attractive to, to uh, a certain, uh, in a certain area or not. All of those things can help us really focus our educational programs and be much more effective with them than what we traditionally have been doing, which is, is kind of almost a traditional advertising campaign where you blast it as far as you can and can't have a specific message or, or, or a tailored message that might be more impactful than just hearing stay away from electric lines. You can be a little bit more prescriptive about what you wanna talk about and, and educate them about specific things that you need to avoid when you're interacting with the system. 
uh, and it, it goes to job vocations and things like that. So I think that's where uh, the most immediate impact we can have with the data without really uh, sacrificing or impacting uh, some of the, the privacy concerns that are, that are very prevalent in, in data sharing at the moment. Those are really actionable things that you can do. You're getting actual new, new intelligence maybe you couldn't get 20 or 30 years ago, and you're able to provide that as a, a value to your customers. That's, that's pretty cool. Um, let, me, let me take a quick pause. We're just over half of the way through our, um, through our hour-long panel. Uh, for the next few minutes, I'm going to ask our panelists to, to uh, you know, where we've been talking about for the, the past 20 or 30 minutes, we've been talking about our experience thus far uh, in, with AI in our sector. I, I want you to look to the future. Uh, think five, ten years down the road and start thinking about, um, you know, how might AI, machine learning, any other kind of related technologies impact the business that, that you do? You know, you can be specific or general. Uh, I'm going to start with Hari in, in just a minute. But I do want to uh, I do, I do say um, to all of the people that are, are logged on, um, you know, let's ask questions in the Q&A for our, our panelists so that, uh, you know, if you have any questions from, uh, again, I mentioned this really diverse set of, of industry, insurance industry perspectives, uh, please start typing those questions into, uh, into the Q&A and we'll, we'll take as many of them as we can. I expect we'll have, uh, you know, 10, maybe 15 minutes towards the end to, to have some more back and forth. Um, but Hari, let me turn to you. You know, tell me how AI is going to influence your job, your role, your sector in the next, you know, two, three, four, five years or so. Yeah, no, I, I can just provide some thoughts, right? You know, at least this is what I am trying. I, I don't have a perfect sort of a crystal ball like many of you guys have. But uh, what I'm trying to do within my team is starting the building blocks, right, towards going towards a, uh, towards initiating AI at some point of time, like, you know, within a year or so. Um, so how I'm thinking about this, I always like to think, start small, think big, scale fast, right? You know, so you have to start small. Um, so what that means is, I like to think that there is no AI without IA, means information architecture. There's no artificial intelligence without information architecture, right? So what I'm trying to do is making our data capture ecosystem very stronger, right? You know, so first of all, we get, I like to say, uh, first party data, right? We get a lot of data from our group business, individual business, um, some of our partners, all that stuff. So that ecosystem of data, data gathering should be very robust, right? From once you have the data, then we can start building some insights out of it, right? And that's where some of the models uh, that different panelists were talking about, right? You know, that model training and all that stuff, right? So, so that, 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 uh, to, to, we have certain models like, you know, next best product, uh, cross sell models, uh, next best action models, all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, that's built in, built, uh, built within, uh, that is getting built within our, organization or within our team so so first have those two like you know have the culture of data gathering and data insights clear before we move into how to activate this right you know in our case we can activate that for our advisors and start small again you know just providing basic nudges to them or we have a client experience portal right where we can start doing some simple nudges, right, you know, using basic rule-based decision-making. And once you get good at it, then you can move towards an AI-based culture, right? You know, how the machines predict based on certain life events of our clients or the advisors they are serving, can we have much more better sophisticated predictions, right, for the future that can help to create some business outcomes, right, uh, for the for the clients and for, for the firm. So, so I, I, I like to think like, you know, that gathering, building that insights, activating, and then ultimately visualizing that for the advisors to take sales or interaction, that, that sort of ecosystem has to be developed in the next three to five years, but you have to start small. 
Uh, but otherwise, you, if you try to go for a home run instead of a bunch of singles, uh, you probably will lose the organization and lose the leaders. They probably wouldn't understand. You just have to make that uh, that, that gradual progression. Uh, that's very wise, Ari. And I think specifically about the data gathering and gathering data that's really useful for your purpose. Um, I find that some of the biggest challenges are, are getting uh, the right data in our job in order to tackle the, the questions that we have. And when we when we don't have the data that speaks directly to our cause, often we look for kind of ancillary or parallel data, and that can that can lead us into uh, some conundrums. Um, let me. Uh, let me turn over to Alex and, and ask Alex, you know, in the next uh, two, five, ten years in your field, you know, where do you expect this kind of technology to take us? What changes do you see uh, being made? Well, hopefully they'll relax HIPAA so um, that we're uh, a little bit less siloed in a lot of the information that we um, that we are able to get. Um, you know, one of the unfortunate things of uh, working with the medical field is a lot of the data um, is under such uh, strict protection silo and, uh, you know, half of it isn't even uh, digitized. So um, I see over the next five, 10 years, um, we will be able to train some of the more uh, complex machine learning models um, as that becomes more streamlined. And um, as you mentioned, Robert, the um, ancillary data that we have to use to um, to, to to basically simulate um, some of the cross relationships um, between certain um, you know uh, between certain risks uh, when we do uh, an assessment or um, you know uh, whatever kind of valuation we're doing. Uh, will allow us to, uh, you know, uh, do that more efficiently and effectively. Um, but a lot of that does depend on the will of, you know, the government to relax some of those restrictions, especially um, in our industry. Uh, other than that, the, um, again, the ancillary data sets, especially for MedMail, have been getting, uh, especially in the last two years, have been uh, getting better and better in terms of, um, you know, just granularity um, and obviously size. That's pretty interesting. Um, I, that, that granularity, I only really expect to, uh, expect to expand. Um, and, and I do think we're going to start getting data on, you know, more and more um, you know, aspects of daily life that we've, we've never really anticipated having data on before. Um, I want to want to turn over to uh, Mahela in your role. You know, can you tell us what what really you see in, in the the risk management and, and, and the other experience you have? Uh, how will machine learning really influence that area over the next you know three or five or ten years? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm I'm very optimistic about about the future of AI in insurance. Um, I think that the insurance industry has passed. Uh, a few important milestones first um, it was a good understanding that AI is not a season fashion but is the future uh, that uh, for adopting AI uh, we need to reconsider the speed and the pace of change which may not have been the a business model in a life insurance uh, for example uh, 10 15 years ago and to be successful of it, we we need a certain type of new talent, technology, and and processes. So with all those understood, I think by now by the insurance end and with the building blocks in place, and I think there are many building blocks uh, creating many organizations across the insurance industry. I, I think the future is bright. Um, one, one of the aspects of the future, which I, I see, I see the um, uh, an importance, increased importance, and recognition of multidisciplinary collaboration. Uh, ben talked um, earlier about the unicorn, uh, the person who would uh, be skilled in several disciplines. We need several disciplines at the table for successful AI uh, uh, deployment uh, or usage. Well, that that uh, 
of course does not exist and of course uh, um, uh, many individuals uh, many of us uh, Ad adopt, uh, gain new skills. However, multidisciplinary collaboration with expertise from various fields is absolutely necessary. That will be uh, at center of, of all activities related to AI. And that will bring the risk, prof uh, risk profession also the table much more than before. Um, and that, will, that will open opportunities for new career paths. Uh, from the risk uh, um, uh, professional side towards, uh, you know, uh, uh, wider uh, ways, wider uh, paths for the future, but also for, from the actuarial side. And it was mentioned before that actuaries start, start to gain um, uh, interest in this field uh, too. Uh, the, the, other, uh, uh, the, the other thing I think that um, the paradigm of thinking about AI will, will shift uh, more and more to clients' needs. Why? Because we can customize uh, with AI, we can be timely, and we can still automate and keep the operations at lo low cost uh, and uh, use the, our, our resources, our human resources, in the best, uh, best way possible. Uh, so that, that's, that's my future. I hope uh, we, we get to. Those are amazing nuggets. I'm going to highlight the two that I, I got the most out of. Uh, first of all, you know, we often think uh, when we have a new technology, how can we use it to improve our situation? And Mihaela, you're saying, yes, we can improve our situation, but shouldn't we be improving that of the customer, of the client? You know, how will the customer's experience, uh, you know, change uh, over the next, you know, five or ten years? So, yes, internal analytics, our own risk management is important, but also how will this change the way we interact with, with our market. Um, the second was your point about the multi multidisciplinary um, advantages that that you know we, we really need. Um, I, for me, nothing kind of brings this more close to home than the coronavirus pandemic that we've lived with over the past 18 months. I think of, especially in the risk management profession, you know, immediately upon upon learning of the the increasing cases, you know, 16. Months ago, uh, we all started thinking this is going to influence what lines of business, you know, health, health insurance, of course, life insurance, mortality, longevity, of course. Um, but, you know, s suddenly it's like everything, everything's impacted, you know, and, and actually maybe the largest impact of life insurance was not mortality or health or longevity at all, but was really the impact to, you know, asset markets and uh, and financial markets and and what that does in terms of the guarantees that we can promise to our customers in the long run. So uh, couldn't agree more, in other words, Mihaela, on a, a multidisciplinary view um, in, in terms of using artificial intelligence for uh, our insurance value chain is, is just is really critical. Um, you know, and, and you did touch on the customer experience. I want to go uh, first to Misha, uh, then to Peter. Um, you know, Misha, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, the customer experience, maybe you and your work, how do you see that uh, changing over the next five or 10 years, thanks to uh, artificial intelligences? Um, please. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Robert. You know, I think, you know, as we are looking to the future, especially in customer experience, we're going to be able to target the right customers more accurately. We're going to be able um, to provide them that service, provide them that offering, provide them that product. However, that's relying on the data that we have, right? And so that's where data, the, in the importance of the data, the value of the data, that data integrity is gonna be so important and so key because if I miss target my customer, I'm going to have to backtrack a little bit and rebuild that trust, right? And so I think, I, Hari, I love what you said about um, start, you know, starting small and thinking big, right? I think it's really important because as you are looking at your data and you're looking at AI and maybe you have those scientists, maybe you don't, whatever it is, when you are looking at that ocean and you're navigating um, to find and locate the right customer, we have to be sure that we trust that data. We have to be confident in that data because again, you have one shot a lot of times with those customers and with those experiences, and you wanna make sure that you get it right and you get it right out the gate. Not to say 
that you would get it, that if you do get it wrong, you have no way to come back to them. That's just a longer customer journey, right? And so I think having that data, starting small, proving out your AI, making sure that it makes sense, making sure that it's accurate, testing it in the market. I think pilots are really important. And I think customers give a little bit more grace when they know that they're part of a pilot, right? Because they feel like they're a part of building something. But I think customer experience, um, it, the success of that is really going to be around the data accuracy and that data integrity component. I, I, th I think that's I think that's incredibly true. Uh, I appreciate those insights, Misha. Um, I want to first uh, go to to Peter uh, to to tell me a little bit about tell us a little bit about the uh, kind of the revolution that, that you think that these technologies will bring to your industry, and then I'll let Hari know that there is a question uh, over in the Q and A that. Uh, well, after after Peter talks, maybe Hari, we can take a little stab at that. So, uh, Peter, tell me about uh, you know the utilities and and tell me about uh, the changes that are happening in your industry over the next five years. Yeah, that, that's a big question at this point. Uh, we're we're kind of on the edge of a dramatic shift uh, on the electric utility industry as a whole. Starting we've, with we've the, got the ten sources. minutes, so you know you can take the whole ten minutes if you need. To. <laughs> I appreciate that. I, I might I might be able to do it. Uh, the, uh, the you going all the way from the sources of generation, where we're going to move from uh, fossil-based uh, generation to more renewable sources, uh, to the types of consumer uh, consumption that we do as the prevalence of electric cars and uh, large data centers that are going to enable a lot of this AI technology going forward start to become they're very energy intensive. So that's going to change. Uh, the landscape of, of uh, where electric power is delivered to, all the way down to uh, us as individual consumers, where we're going to see a, a greater prevalence of smart meters that will allow for real-time understanding of, of how power usage is, is, or how power is being used at your homes, and turn us a little bit more into uh, consumers when it comes to electric power, as uh, you'll be able to differentiate use of power during uh, typical times where power may be more expensive or may be less expensive. It may be able to inform you that, hey, if you do your laundry at seven o'clock at night, it's going to save you $10 a year or $100 a year on your bill. So uh, those technologies are all going to uh, start to really uh, push us towards uh, an AI-driven uh, consumerism, but also as, as, a, uh, as an electric provider, uh, it gives us the opportunity to really uh, – be a little bit more aware of how power is being used and then also what is happening on the electric grid as a whole. And as we're able to interpret that and, and uh, adjust to that more quickly, that leads to a more stable grid. And something that's very important to a lot of consumers is, is how we respond to storms and how we can stay resilient in the face of uh, storms that may knock out power. Are we able to reroute power more efficiently? Are we able to see where uh, there are trouble areas that we can get to more quickly. And specifically to, to what I do, um, incident prevention. If we can get a little bit more accurate about understanding whether a line is just uh, having a surge of power or whether it's actually down and de-energize those lines so that they're not a danger to the public once they've, they've uh, been blown down or been knocked down by a tree, that could really dramatically reduce the amount of events that we have um, beyond even that education piece uh, where we're not even as quite as concerned about interacting with the power system as we were before because we're able to shut those things down before uh, an incident were able to, was able to occur. So there's a lot of really dramatic changes that are on, we're on the precipice of, and, and it's interesting to see not only what's going to happen in the next year, uh, but in 10 years, it, sh it should be something that's dramatically different, although utilities do tend to be a little bit lumbering when it comes to change. So hopefully uh, AI even increases their ability to be flexible and, and to change a little bit more quickly than they've seen in the past. I mean, Peter, speaking for everyone here in the west coast of Florida, I certainly hope, you know, in our hurricane vulnerable areas that you guys uh, were certainly pulling for you. Because um, anticipating those events is, uh, is is really critical for us. Every uh, day of 95 degree heat and no power is uh, is terrifying. 
Um, you know, I, I told uh, Hari, we've got one question from the audience and welcome other questions. We've really opened up on the future of, of AI and insurance. Hari, we've got a question, you know, about, about practicality. How can we avoid the impracticality of, of growing really expensive databases with tons of data with information that, that may not have been shown to have value yet? What are your perspectives on that? No, that's a great question. I was uh, just looking at that thread. So I agree, like, you know, sometimes uh, I think Peter said this well, like, you know, you can be data rich, but insights poor, right? You know, you, you don't want to store volumes and volumes of data into that, right? So I agree, you know, the data that doesn't matter why you want to store it, right? So that's definitely a good viewpoint. The a bit of a counter argument to that is the compute power is very cheap now, right? You know, you can store volumes and volumes of data into, depending on like, you know, where your organization is at, right? You know, are you an on-prem organization or a, are you a hybrid or a, are you a cloud-based organization, right? To store that compute and uh, storing that data is very cheap, right? In my experience, at least, I am not saying this is right or wrong, until you get the data, understand that data more closely, you don't you don't understand the predictability power of that data, right? So, for example, in my experience in past organization and my current organization, see, for example, some of the data that has better predictability, right? You know, in our case, age matters, tenure with our organization matters deep relationship with an advisor matters for model training and providing that predictability to say, if you have some of these data points, then your models are better. But we found that until we got whole volumes of data, right? You know, we have about hundreds of data points and only four or five has that predictability power, right? Um, for more from modeling perspective and uh, that can create machine learning and AI based outcomes from a client experience perspective or advisor experience perspective. So until you get through the volumes of the data and my previous point about start small, right, you know, and think big, but until you evaluate it, you cannot come to an analytics predictability on what's the value, what really matters for you, right? So, um, and, and that's how I learned. And many times I failed uh, to just go after some data points you feel that mattered and uh, didn't get to a good outcome. And, uh, you know, just kind of learn iterate from that data, uh, that volumes of data. So well, hopefully I provided some color on that. Yeah, that's, that's very helpful. Thank you so much. Um, we're coming up to the end of our uh, end of our hour. I'll leave a couple of minutes if there's any kind of parting thoughts. I want to thank uh, Nitin for pulling together this group. And I want to thank our panelists. Uh, Misha, Hari, Alex, Mahela, and Peter uh, for joining us from from all across uh, all across North America and for giving us their perspectives from a, a variety of backgrounds, which I, I think is really important. Uh, you know, as, as Mahela said it well, having kind of a multidisciplinary um, approach to some of these questions uh, can, can really can really improve. Uh, really improve our solutions. Um, I'll open it up to the floor. If there's any final remarks, you're, you're welcome to you're welcome to have a, another minute or so. So, in the in the absence of that, uh, Nitin, I just want to say thank you again, AI Core sure. for having us. And um, you know, we're about at the top of the hour or the bottom of the hour for the next presentation. Yeah, I think we are exactly on time. We have three minutes. Uh, that's the beauty, I think, of the time which you have. You want to wrap it up in that particular time. But I was amazed to see the quality of, uh, I can say the variety, quality and variety of talks which you all had uh, in your particular domain. Right from Robert, you handled it perfectly well. The panel discussion was amazing. You introduced everyone first. That's the best part. And then gave the questions and yeah, we have the audience question as well. And it was, obviously there has to be some contractory ag ag agreement means hurry said something and there's a contrary to that. I think it's a perfect one and uh, it's a perfect way to network with each other. Thanks a lot everyone for your valuable insights. Um, any parting thoughts before we close for the panel discussion? I liked it personally. This was excellent panel discussion.
Any parting thoughts from any one of you? Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so Take much, care, guys. And Robert. Thank you, guys. Right. Take care. Have a lovely day ahead. Have a lovely weekend ahead as well. You as well. Bye. Yeah. Bye. So, guys, uh, we'll quickly move on to our uh, next presenter, which is Atul Bora. So, Atul is the chief marketing officer in Solera, and uh, he will be presenting on the next topic, which is automotive industry and artificial intelligence. Uh, so, may I ask my colleague Irvin to do the honors as well? I think Atul is joining. So, he has just joined, and he will be joining, I think, in one minute. Hey, every time I get bounced off, it keeps asking, let me. Yeah, Atul, uh, are you there? Is, uh, I am, your... I am. I'm sorry. Okay. There, there seems to be some gremlin. And... Okay. Oh, yeah. You are there now. Perfectly well. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Over to you, Atul. Thank you very much. I really appreciate this opportunity. And uh, from the sound of the panel before, it seems to be a very lively audience. I wish I was in person and able to interact with uh, all of you in the audience and we'll try and make it a little bit interactive. But my name is Atul Bora and I am, as I said, excited to talk to you about our view on AI in the collision industry. I am the chief marketing officer and regional managing director for our business in Canada. And uh, if we could, Arvind, please go to the next slide. So I want to very quickly, we have only 20 minutes, spend a couple of minutes on uh, the company so that you know why we have the credibility to speak about collisions and then get into what we believe is the state of the art today and where we will be headed. So without further ado, to give you a sense of our credibility on the next slide, please, in the collision industry, if we can go to the next one. So Solera is a is a global data intelligence and technology leader in vehicle lifecycle management. And what we mean by that is we are, through our data and technology solutions at each of the, we've mapped 54 key touch points in vehicle ownership. And vehicle here refers to passenger cars, trucks, and fleet. And these 54 touch points are buying, insuring, financing, uh, scheduled repair, unscheduled repair, collision, which happens only once in about, you know, it's, the, the rate is 7 to 8% in most of the developed world, but it's obviously the most traumatic touch point. Um, resale, end of life, and, and, you know, you're back to the cycle again. That is what we do for a living. And the reason it's relevant to this discussion is because we have deep, deep domain knowledge. And we have this across 100 plus countries that we operate in. And you can see from some of the data on this slide, we, um, you know, we've got an enormous, enormous depth of data through transactions. And I'll talk to that a little bit more in the one that follows. So if we go to the next slide, please. 
this gives you a sense of the four pillars that constitute those 51, 54 touch points. I start with claims because that is the genesis of our company. It's also, as I said, the most traumatic, the most involved touch point other than purchase. But we have as well depth in repair. We have the Google for mechanics. We have depth in solutions, which is really dealer CRM, the fixed ops and the revenue ops uh, back office solutions, and then fleet total cost management. So this gives us the credibility to talk automotive because we really are deep, deep in, in these verticals that help the automotive ownership experience. What is also really clear, and this will come through the, the, the slides and the, that follow, is our depth in both data science and repair science. And let me explain that on the next slide, please. But before we get to data science, and this is a segue to that, I want to involve the audience. Where do you believe the trust level is with consumers to for a process that's driven by AI. Let me rephrase that. If we were to ask consumers, as we did, what percentage of claims process would you trust to be driven by AI? And if we do a poll right now, I'd love to get a sense of what the audience says, and then I'll reveal the answer. So um, you have the options up there. One, two, three, four, and I want to see what the answer looks like. So, 50% of the people are obviously very in sync with the world because if we go to the next slide, that is indeed the answer. And it shouldn't be very surprising because when you think about our lives today, they're led by the smartphone, which is full of AI experiences within it. You go to Netflix, you go to Amazon, you get recommendations. So why would insurance be any different? And that is what our research shows us. Consumers are ready. And the next slide will tell you that insurers want to get there, but they have some concerns. So if you go to the next slide, if you think about the insurers, they get it. They get it that they need to get to this level and COVID has obviously accelerated that awareness. They get the fact that the need for touchless claims, fully automated, straight through processing is all paramount. But what's slowing down the adoption by insurers is for our research, it's fundamentally three things. What they believe is the time it takes to market, the cost to implement, and the scalability. Because frankly, what you're seeing is a lot of startups with claimed AI capabilities. But when you look at major insurers who've got millions of policies, they've got to have industrial strength, scalability, security, um, it's, it's worrisome. And I would be worried if I were them because you're exposing both your customers and most importantly, all the data that's around it um, you know, to, to someone who may or may not be scalable. So that's the concern and that's what's slowing down the, the insurers. So where do we go from here? And um, this is where I wanna spend the bulk of my limited time today is to walk you through how ready we are and what we do and how we do it. So the next slide will show us what we do And, and fundamentally, it is multiple AI engines running both computer vision, which is taking a picture and being able to go from the picture all the way to a line estimate. And again, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna go through some of these really fast so I can spend more time. Let's go to the next one, please. So let's stop here and spend some time on this slide. Anyone who's been in a collision, either as a, an insured or as an insurance company, will know that the process which starts with the first notice of loss right up on the left top corner, um, till the time the repair is authorized and finally it is completed, could be weeks. Uh, and I'm not talking about a total loss, which could be months, 
I'm not talking even about a very involved non-drive repair. Even for minor scrapes, your bumper is dangling, it could be weeks. Uh, and that's the process which is becoming untenable for both consumers and insurers. What we're able to do with AI today is essentially take weeks into minutes. And if you follow along the chevrons, what you will see is that there are two parts that typically happen. There is a self-service path which has started in recent times, but it's typically still rather clunky. It involves downloading an application in many cases, uh, and it's incomplete. It's not, you know, you get some part of the process done and then you get handed over. And then there is a professional part, which is a workflow, which is really an appraiser or a surveyor. And both these revolve around first identifying a damage and then writing an estimate. What we're able to do with AI is converge these with the help of a few pictures and in literally under one second a picture, it's a sub-second, the engine is so fast. So even if you have 10 pictures, you're really looking at a 10 second timeline to determine what the damages are. We have the capability then to do some front-end triage, which really means you can identify whether this is a total loss, it's a, it's a small and medium repair, or it's a more involved repair, and route the vehicle and the driver accordingly. So if it's a very small repair, think of the use cases. The, the, if the consumer took the picture himself or herself, she may decide not even to file an insurance claim um, and to get it repaired themselves. Alternately, if it was a professional services person who took the picture, they're able to send it to the right shop and already alert the shop of the, the parts and uh, the likely repair processes that are going to be needed. Interestingly, you see the, you see the call out on top and that says if it's a total loss, there's a huge amount of cost that insurers incur and consumers suffer on count of the delays that are caused in determining the total loss, multiple toes, um, you know, the, the, the need to do assessments, appraisals, make sure it's defensible, et cetera. We have an ability to do a much quicker settlement. And what's very popular in Europe and eventually might, might become more popular in the United States and Canada as well as the opportunity to do a cash settlement for even a minor repair. So all of that is facilitated by AI, and it's, as I said, literally in minutes. But even if you go down the path of a traditional repair, once you have the estimate, and I'll show you what we do on the next slide, we're able to do an AI-assisted review, authorize it, send it to the right shop, and you know the customer journey has gone from being it still is traumatic, so no one can take away the emotion, particularly if, as I said, it's a severe lo loss uh, in terms of severity. But we've taken away a lot of the aggravation and we're able to route them to the right place, give them a very good estimate, as you've seen already in, in record time. So let me show you the next slide, which tells you a little bit about how we do it. So this is what we do. I want to show you, a, give you a glimpse on how we do it. And this is the secret sauce. This is what, as I said, makes it scalable and sets us apart. So I talked about our history and our width and depth of data. If you drop to the bottom of the page, we have a database. We've been doing this for 50 years. We have data on 99.9% .9 of the cars on Mother Earth. So whether you're driving a brand new Tesla and you collided into a Ford Taurus 2001, we have the data on both. So this data, which goes back multiple years, but even if you look at just the last 10 years, gives us about 270 million historical claims. We've got about four and a half billion images of damaged vehicles. We've actually tagged these images. And so we're able through our data science to very accurately, in record time, under a second a picture, identify the damages and the vehicle. So that's part of the story. Others can do that, 
perhaps not with the same level of depth, but what very few are able to do is what follows on those chevrons. Since we have been building our own data for 50 years and we have been repairing cars for as long, we have a depth of domain knowledge, which we call repair science, because literally when we build the data, we repair the car in our heads. So that level of knowledge enables us when we get the damage identified to produce a line estimate for that model, for that vehicle, and that specific damage, which is what you see on the iPhone picture on the right rail. So the point I'm trying to make, friends, is AI is scalable in the solutions we're talking about because it is based on a depth of data science and it's based on repair science, not statistical approximations. And that's what gives the comfort to insurers. And indeed, as we speak, we've got literally tens of pilots happening around the world because this is exciting and people are ready for it. Um, and, and as I said, the future is, you'll see momentarily how the future is going to be shaped by this technology. So that's, I wish we were able to interact, but that gives you a sense of how you go from a simple picture taken on a smartphone. We have masks and guided ways to guide that image, but it doesn't require a special app. It's a web link to getting a detailed line estimate. And based on that, to being able to go directly to a repair shop that's already been informed that you're arriving and has at, at a minimum created the capacity to serve you and perhaps started to pre-order some of the parts. So let's go to the next slide and we'll try and bring this to closure quickly to be in time. So what we believe this is going to do is first and foremost, give the choice and flexibility. Fundamentally, we live in an economy where consumers want anytime, anywhere choices. These technologies give the insurance and the body shop the ability to react and work with consumers wherever they are, whether they're doing it from their garage, they're doing it from a dealership, a roadside. It's, it's, it's complete consumer freedom. And what this automation and touchless operation that I've just kind of described does is it fundamentally releases capacity, makes it more cost effective. And our purpose and mission in life is that that capacity should then be decked towards serving the consumers better, whether it is in reviews, whether it is in hand-holding them through the car replacement, through the other aspects of the collision that are more traumatic and need personal care. And, and again, what you will find with this technology is the use cases are only just beginning to appear. What I've defined is a few use cases in rapid order, standard collision, perhaps triage, perhaps cash out, but start to think about what else you could do with it. You could use this rental for rental car returns. You could use this for lease car returns. You, sh you could use this every time there is a tow to, you know, because the technology is so ubiquitous and it is so inexpensive, relatively speaking, you could use it anytime the car and the driver were being parted for some reason. So you park it at a garage, you give it to a valet, you want to record how the car was and how you received it back, you have the ability to do that. So that's kind of where we're leading this to, which is democratizing the whole idea of knowing where your car is and how you should uh, maintain it and keep it from a risk and asset management point of view. So I know we're about at the end of our time um, and I want to wrap up, if we just go to the next slide, please, with where I believe the world is going and then there'll be one more pop quiz question at the end. So first and, f no, 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 you've gone too far. Um, so first and foremost, straight through processing is here. We are in a world where everything that can be done instantly should, and that's what this will enable. It's not going to be exactly instant, but it's going to be much, much faster. The second is, and I'm trying to bring through the power of the integrated end-to-end -end systems. 
the point of individual point solutions and cobbling them together is 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 not necessary it creates risks it creates scalability issues and we're we're able to avoid that with you know partners like ourselves that have the ability to go end to end because we have grown up in the collision industry and you know i didn't talk about the other things we do which is glass and subrogation and all of that lends itself to similar the um, ai and, and straight through uh, the innovation and transformation that I'm talking about applies not just to your standard um, IC engines and vehicles. We are a partner and a proud partner with many EV manufacturers, including the leading ones that you know. We completely are um, you know, in the camp where we believe that this will evolve and autonomous and EVs will become uh, you know, increasingly important and we're ready for that. We're also in the in in the belief that while we have integrated solutions, we will have industry partnerships. We are partnering with Google. We are partnering with Treton, which is the parent of Volkswagen, um, to bring digitization into transportation. So, I'd like to close before I ask the pop quiz question with one takeaway. When you think about AI and you think about the vehicle. Collision is obviously what we're gathered to talk about, but please think about the whole life cycle. And it's when you think about the life cycle from purchase to repair, maintenance, collision, end of life, that you see the dots coming together and companies like Solera having a big role to play. So with that, and so as we're on time, I'd like to ask the final question and do another poll. Can we go to the next slide, please? So are you ready? We asked earlier whether we thought consumers and insurers were ready, but you are the people that drive the business and drive the change. So are you ready for a fully automated touchless claims process? And we'll go to the poll and, and see what the results are. Okay, so I think this is a, a, uh, a very uh, realistic and honest group. So I thank you for that. It's only about a third that are ready, as you can see. Um, I would encourage you to embrace the change because the change is here. And it's, it's not, and maybe the question is loaded because fully automated, fully touchless is an evolution. But I would, I would really, really encourage everyone on this call to embrace the change. It's not going to be perfect. It's going to be a bit of a rocky um, you know, evolution, but it's exciting. It's really exciting because we are going to free up human beings to do what they do best, look after each other. With that, thank you very much for this opportunity. I want to leave my name and number for anyone who wants a follow-on conversation. Happy to engage directly and thank you so much Nitin and team uh, to, for this great platform which I've had a few technical issues with but I, I appreciate the platform in terms of the ability to reach so many of you so thank you again thank you thank you Atul. thank you and it was a lovely presentation in which you shows which showed basically how automation can do a lot of things uh, uh, in the insurance industry and how the car claim process can be minimized by using AI. So uh, anybody of you has a question for Atul, uh, please shoot. You can just type in the Q&A section and Atul will be happy to yeah, help you I'd out be, in case. Yeah. I'd be very happy to take questions. Um, hey guys, anyone you want to take ask questions to Atul, very happy. Otherwise, you can obviously connect to him on LinkedIn. You can shoot an email to him and he will be happy to help you out. Totally. You, there is a third way also. You can reach to us and we can help you reach out to Atul. Yeah, whichever way suits. Whichever way you find easy, please do that. The idea is to get into a conversation, so. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Atul. Thank you for the thank lovely you so presentation. Much. Yeah, thank you for giving a lovely insight and we'll stay connected for uh, future uh, events as well and uh, as well as future partnerships. If any comes to us, we'll let it on to you. Thank you. Look forward. Thank you.
Thank you. Bye. Bye, Catherine. Thanks a lot, a lot for the support which you had. Thanks a lot. Okay, guys, we'll quickly move on to our next presenter so that we are in time with the thing. So Catherine is there. Catherine, um, uh, can you just put on your uh, PPT for the thing? So Catherine is the Vice President NFP, and she will take the next talk. So guys, this talk will be the second last, last talk for the virtual half-day event. Um, hopefully, you're enjoying it and uh, you are getting the maximum output out of this. So I'll leave Catherine to do the talk now. Catherine, over to you. Thank you, Nitin. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me on this session. My name is Catherine Minami. I'm a vice president at NFP Property and Casualty. I have been working nearly 20 years in the financial services sector. Throughout my experience in banking, corporate strategy, and now insurance, a common discipline has been my understanding of operations and systems management. Today, I will share with you what I do as a broker, why I'm excited about the digital era that we're in, and how AI for insurance can further enhance the people connectivity and business opportunities. A little bit about NFP. NFP is a private company with over 6,000 employees and in 330 locations. Three core business operations are corporate benefits, property and casualty, and individual solutions. This diagram depicts innovation and technology as a fourth sector here, but quite frankly, it is part of the business operations aforementioned. Within the property and casualty business operation, my management liability department has launched a study and I'm spearheading the development of a management liability platform for my group. The insurance industry is indeed a people business. Uh, business. As a broker, my primary responsibility is to support my clients, represent them before the insurance companies, assisting them with procuring the right management liability product uh, to put in place and support them with their risk mitigation strategies. Now, my day-to-day -day business involves many different activities, including <laughs> emails, sometimes benefits and evils that an email may be, phone calls, a lot of follow-ups, meetings, in-person conferences like this, and sometimes golf outings. My involvement with developing this digital platform has really caused me to rethink the way that I do my everyday tasks, breaking down everything into a step-by-step -step workflow diagram. This is a way to challenge the traditional way of doing things as a broker. The way I launch my everyday with client is meeting with them, trying to understand who they are, what they are, what are their concerns from a risk exposure perspective, supporting them with resources, and then finally sending them an application form to either complete digitally on their desktop or manually they print it out and <laughs> fill it in. For management liability perspective, uh, it can be a rather lengthy process completing that application form. If you consider right now with cybersecurity, one of the insurance products that I'm also involved with, there are a lot of additional questions uh, that are required by many of the underwriters as that risk is evolving every day. My other steps from a traditional perspective, as I've mentioned, emails, phone calls, all of this is quite time consuming to finally be able to procure, obtain that final policy document, which in turn, I try to, to summarize for the clients to express to them some of those complex terms and conditions into digestible matter. Now, what has been coming up currently is these digital platforms, whether hosted by insurance companies or other formats that have, are existing today. These digital platforms are usually designed with API integration and AI technologies involved, which is great because it supports the shortening of that time process for me as a broker to turn around and, and engage my client. These digital platforms are many from a insurance carrier hosted type uh, entities. 
which while the time efficiency of procuring a, a bindable quote is great, it does cause me to remember a lot more login passwords every time I try to reach out to an insurance market and obtain a quote to then present to my client. From my perspective, at least what I'm accountable for is to deliver to my clients multiple options. In the DNO market space, I have nearly 40 direct market contacts just to have DNO policy. There are new digital platforms that are coming on board online, um, such as Relay Platform, which is the company that I've engaged to help my group develop digital platforms specific for management lines, insurance products. What it does is it focuses on the broker's needs to be able to engage to multiple insurance carriers through one portal versus many portals to several uh, separate insurance carriers. The multiple portals or the multiple platforms is just an example of uh, what I already engage with on a day-to-day -day basis. A lot of systems that I currently have internally in order to comply with best practices or um, other guidelines required of me as a broker. For these multiple systems, I have written a uh, rough draft of a plan that uh, engaging disciplines within the AI toolkit, machine learning and NLP, I think will further improve and enhance efficiencies with my process and then be able to release a little bit of time there to further engage with clients and strengthen those relationships with underwriters. Traditional systems that I have internally include CRM systems, making sure I update when I engage with a client, invoice generating systems, making sure my accounting firm, my accounting department knows when to collect the revenue, client ready presentations, local tax filing, these are finite use systems that it's not just my firm, but I understand from my experience, other companies also have these uh, several disconnected systems. What I envision with AI for insurance is that it'll help connect these systems uh, through a process uh, that can either include machine learning and natural language processing. A course taught by a faculty member at MIT breaks down how machine learning can be implemented. And the three ways that he expressed this implementation of machine learning is by designing, formulating the problem into a machine learning problem, uh, understanding availability of data, and the frequency or application of the data. So I see that my fellow speakers here on this conference have sort of bro broken out the aspects like this within their own AI tools that have, they are already using uh, today. For a broker's perspective, at least from here, my traditional standpoint where I stand with these several systems, I find that my design of machine learning, I envision would include uh, capturing all of these repetitive tasks that a broker has to do, and then helping support a more efficient process. The availability of data does exist there. And with the support of digital platforms, we can only further collect that data that will support my conversations with the clients, conversations with the underwriters to negotiate the right uh, rate, terms, and conditions, and then turn around and uh, distribute a concise uh, document that will help the client, the insured, better understand the aspects of their policy. The frequency of the data that is collected can only be further enhanced with uh, AI as the time that it requires will be shifted from the manual entry into more of the digital capturing, uh, whether it's Python programming, web scraping for publicly available information. I know from my cyber products that there are several vendors that are engaged with insurance markets. And some of these vendors are scan, uh, like web scanning, for example. They can deduce from the publicly available information online uh, any exposures that a particular uh, insured may have from their website and other connectivity that they may have on the internet. Machine learning would be a very powerful tool for uh, brokers. And I know it is uh, 
being implemented in its many facets uh, with these digital platforms. Natural language processing is also a great way to for information extraction. Sentiment analysis, I write this down here because uh, it does help with that in-person engagement with a client, assisting them with understanding sometimes these complex policies that a DNO policy can be, employment practices, liability policy can be, uh, to better understand and know where their risk mitigation strategy, supporting with them with designing a mis risk mitigation strategy can help. So I've expressed sort of the current state of uh, a broker today with the several systems that exist, um, highlighted to uh, AI disciplines, machine learning, natural language, uh, following that kind of step-by-step -step of understanding where the current state is. This is the sort of the process that uh, I have actually practiced with developing the digital platform that I'm working uh, on right now for management lines uh, insurance products. I had to depict a workflow diagram, really breaking down every step and identifying where we can improve those processes. Sort of a project management hat I had to hold here. The proposed initiative here was uh, identifying those areas that where we could cut the time, understanding the level of effort that would require engaging our technology experts from a programming standpoint, from a design graphic standpoint, certainly the experience as a user of that platform was very important to make it attractive, make it usable and um, easy to train for onboarding new colleagues of mine. I think this would apply to any new technology, especially in today's culture where we just wanna tap our screens and get um, ice cream in two hours. Uh, and then plan to action I identify here as um, having the buy-in from management, uh, developing a committee. So with, for in my example, with developing the digital platform, uh, we have the uh, head of engineering involved, um, data scientist, uh, I kind of fill in with data extraction internally, um, my business leaders and other colleagues of mine who are experts in specific products have been help it, helpful to create the plan to move forward with executing a timeline and establishing milestones. Communication has been key. Testing and training, certainly something that is ingrained in the plan. And then something that's very important per John P. Cotter's leading change, um, why transformation can fail. He's written uh, a a very interesting book on that is this continuous improvement and succession. You can't just plug in a solution, but something that I feel very conscious about, which is making sure that someone else can pick up how to improve as the digital transformation is not just for today, but it is for tomorrow. I will stop now. And um, if anyone has any questions, looking forward to answering them. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Catherine. Uh, guys, anyone, anyone of you have any questions? Please shoot on to Catherine. Uh, you can type in the chat box also. There's a Q and A section. I'll wait for one minute. It was a lovely presentation, Catherine. Thanks a lot for sharing your idea. We'll just wait for one minute, and then uh, if no question comes, we can start with our next presentation. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Catherine, uh, for the lovely presentation and taking your time uh, and to speak on this uh, forum. Uh, hope to see you in future as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So, guys, uh, I know in a half day we had so many presentations, but uh, this is the presentation you have been 
waiting for and you want to listen to that rich that rich is from switzerland and see you know that rich there is one part first presentation and the last presentation for the day always gives a insight to the audience and to people who are listening to you so <laughs> so it's always best thing that that's a wonderful honor uh, to have thank you thank you so much for organizing it that way <laughs> it's great to have you and uh, uh, obviously you represent a great company as well swiss ray so i'll hand it over to you i'll just read out the topic details to the audience so that they are aware of what you will be going to speak on so detrich will be speaking on how ai is in automotive and mobility insurance from a global reinsurance perspective and applications so over to you detrich for the last talk for the day thank you thank you and and uh, maybe just quick check can, can you see my screen or is is there anything presented on the screen right now uh, not at this point oops that would not be as intended let me see okay oh sorry i have to actually accept to share so yeah yes come on that could become better yes wonderful thank you yeah i mean th thanks again nitin for the for the nice uh, the nice introduction and and from having me as a speaker today i'm really excited to to share some of our perspectives on the the topic of ai and how we apply that and specifically in the in the mobility domain uh, automotive and, and and mobility as the the title suggests um so i hope so far i mean everybody enjoyed today i think it was quite intense um i i could follow some of the some of the presentations and i found it very very insightful um as for myself at swiss re maybe just a quick introduction um uh, at swiss re i take the responsibility for thought leadership development and commercialization of claims and connected vehicle products and services uh, with our clients so i talk to clients uh, where we bring our our solutions to bear uh, i specialized in the domains of connected mobility and, and claims and vehicle telemetry and i previously held uh, some leadership positions both in the startup space as well as uh, two decades in the global management and technology uh, consulting uh, area uh, also focusing on kind of uh, connected mobility and the blur between oem industry insurance and uh, and and ai um uh from a training i'm uh, have a master's degree in computer science from swiss federal institute of of technology um i i took from the um from the introduction or from it, when we talked maybe not everybody is aware with what Swiss Re is doing and 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 who we are so i i thought i'll just give a few uh, a few words at the uh, at the beginning um uh, to 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 frame that so Swiss Re is really an organization that was developed with and for the insurance industry 158 years ago actually in Switzerland and that was on the back of a large fire that destroyed interestingly that destroyed my later hometown um at that time and uh, uh, today uh, if we look at our mission at our, at our vision today we basically say we want to make the world more resilient and we do this with with four aspects or uh, in our mission we provide fresh and innovative innovative perspectives um apply knowledge expertise and capital uh, and we try to anticipate and analyze and, and manage new risks uh, that, that occur um, and create their therefrom uh, data and technology driven smart solutions for our clients obviously if you look at that and we look at the world world that means we need to have kind of a global setup and uh, this just gives a quick perspective um how our global setup look like looks like so we have obviously clients and at, at a global scale and also presences in in 29 countries and 81 offices uh, roughly over 13000 uh, employees uh, spanning across 121 nationalities um and from a from a business kind of earnings perspective it's about the 40 41 billion uh, uh, pre, uh US dollar premium business Need to quickly close the door to remove external noise um in terms of our clients so we have our insurance companies are our clients governments are our clients uh that would be covered with what we call reinsurance but we also have uh, corporations which are our clients such as automotive uh, manufacturers 
and also retail customers through our wide labeling uh, uh, carrier and, and digital platform, uh, which we call it DQ. And all of this is backed by data-driven risk insights and services researched and developed at, at, the, at the group level. Uh, today, what I want to do is give a bit of an overview of what we do in the automotive and mobility space, as I mentioned, uh, and how we try to kind of anticipate new risks in there and provide uh, solutions uh, for our clients. And I mean, motor insurance, uh, this is, it's a really uh, important business, uh, both for our insurance clients, uh, it's, it's a key contributor uh, to their business, uh, but also for our um, automotive manufacturing uh, clients. And at the same time, this is an industry, as we've heard today, that is undergoing quite some, some change. Uh, the, the demand for mobility is constantly growing, uh, while the domain in itself, if you look at the automotive manufacturers, try to become uh, more digital and as mobility uh, models uh, change. So how do we tackle that? Um, what we basically see is that we organize ourselves and our efforts along four key trends that are listed on the left side here uh, on, on the slides. Um, four key trends around the, the, the how, how we see the, the motor domain uh, de develop. Uh, and I quickly go through them. Uh, connected really means the vehicles will be connected. And actually today, the vast majority of vehicles are already connected. But the key point is that that data that they produce is also become accessible. Uh, so the focus here is really on kind of infer usage, behavior, performance, and incident-related scores and triggers uh, from that connected vehicle data. Uh, then uh, vehicles will, of course, be more shared uh, in, in the future. That will require more scrutiny over the way how uh, the vehicle was treated when the driver is not uh, the actual owner of it. And that specifically relates to detecting damages, assigning indemnity, and so forth. Uh, vehicles will also become more electric, obviously, and hopefully. Um, but that opens also a somewhat uncharted territory on experience with longevity of battery lifetimes, but also implying materially different, let's say, mechanical repair approaches, uh, typically also coming at higher costs. And last and not uh, last but not least, vehicles will run increasingly automated uh, at the current stage, more in an assistant manner in the kind of levels one and two of the uh, SAE um, uh, the definitions of, of, of levels. Uh, but then uh, when the systems uh, are enabling automation levels three to five, that really implies that there are own behavioral risks uh, from the algorithms and AI that is that are controlling the vehicle's operations. And obviously these risks need to be quantifiable to enable kind of a meaningful risk transfer from manufacturers to risk carriers um, as a kind of catalyst to uh, continuous uh, uh, AV development and, and adoption. So we see uh, pl plenty of opportunity and, and uh, demand uh, for, for risk inside services, both for risk transfer, so the, the insurance, but also for solutions, digital solutions, which make the businesses um, and the way how our clients run their businesses uh, uh, better and, and improve the way how they do uh, their businesses. And on that slide, you kind of can see painted along the value chain of insurance where we have uh, uh, or, or where we focus our, our efforts. Uh, there is certainly uh, some, some gravitation towards the kind of high leverage, high value areas on product underwriting, pricing and claims. Um, uh, and uh, for the sake of the, the presentation today, I want to focus kind of on, on, on two areas. Uh, one area that has already also been, been, been covered, I think, quite, quite a few times uh, around claims as the first example. And the second then is kind of a consequence thereof, uh, kind of the holistic real-time scoring, uh, which is an extension of an offering uh, we, uh, we, we are currently having. And I just want to give you some aspects in there as to how we are, how we are leveraging uh, AI uh, in there. Um, overall, gaining risk insights from actual incidents like, like claims right, and losses incurred 
is, of course, a super important ingredient for the actuarial process, and provided that the right data is captured digitally, um, that uh, really helps in, in creating, uh, creating scoring and pricing at the vehicle and even driver level uh, in a much more dynamic and precise manner as uh, traditionally uh, possible in a kind of traditional uh, actuarial uh, approach. And of course, the same applies also to claims handling. Um, so uh, let's look a bit at how we use AI to kind of help identify that right data uh, for a claim notification in an initial notification uh, of a loss. And I'll, for, for, for the sake of simplicity, I'll uh, kind of focus on the, uh, let's say, the physical damage uh, aspect of the, of, of the business uh, and not so much on the, uh, on, on the people damage um, but uh, the, the physical damage makes up about 50 to 65 percent of the claim cost block, so it's a material baseline for value added uh, services. We had seen before, interestingly, a <laughs> presentation, it's at, it's at minutes, not days, uh, in, in the presentation of Solera. I think that this we, we, we share the same view there, right? And, and we really see transformational change enabled from bringing the loss assessment and the, the settlement right to the front of the actual claim process, merging it with the first notification. So deciding upon what is captured, uh, how the, the case should be handled and what the right next step should be, and thereby ideally enabling a one contact uh, uh, claim claim settlement. And uh, I, I even put here seconds because uh, what we really strive for is, is, is a real-time process. Um, and this contrasts uh, the typical status quo that you observe today where you have complicated tools typically re uh, requiring human expertise uh, or repair personnel to, uh, to populate that and to handle the complexity of a damage assessment and, and the subsequent cost estimations so that the insurer would know how much to pay. And we strive to make this a, um, a machine solvable problem, applying AI techniques amongst other disciplines. And that obviously will shorten the time to decide the settlement of a claim from days as I, as I write here, to, to seconds or maximum minutes, uh, and providing a much more immediate and contemporary user experience to the person that is actually notifying the, the claimant with uh, substantial subsequent cost savings. And to, to achieve this um, in a reliable manner, we deploy kind of three building blocks to the, to the solution uh, where we use AI techniques uh, together with our partners. And I want to highlight uh, upon this example on the left side here, uh, how this, uh, how we, how we do this. So the, this, this kind of uh, stylized, uh, the, the damaged car, uh, car picture on the left. Uh, firstly, and that's depicted with the bubble number one there in, uh, in green. Uh, what, what you of course need is a, a meaningful abstraction of the, the damage features. Um, to end the vehicle features in, in order to apply any sort of uh, any sort of AI. And if you think about vehicles, uh, they're inherently complicated constructions of anything between five and 10,000 uh, distinctive parts um, uh, for each manufacturer and each model. Uh, and then with, uh, on top of that, the high degree of individualization uh, potential with extra equipment. So, uh, this is not uh, not a simple task, and while some features are common and there is a consensus about their relevance, such as common parts like a windshield or, or a front door, other features related to, for example, cost-sensitive equipment, like the type of headlight systems or consequential and not directly visible damages, uh, are more tricky to be depicted analytically. And um, that's an area where we use AI-based prediction models trained on different sets of features to kind of iteratively optimize the, the feature set uh, used for a claim notification. Um, obviously, this requires uh, extensive calibration and training data, which we get uh, through partners uh, and obviously through the operational business over time. And that data also needs to be labeled accordingly, either manually, which is very labor intensive and, and expensive, uh, or automatically, which is what we, uh, what we try to focus on. And typically repair invoices or detailed repair codes are a good basis to start with on, on that. Then secondly, once the model is clear, um, the, um, or the, 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 the input model is clear the, in blue, the point number two, is the actual population. So how is a claim notified and how are we applying AI in there? 
and, and you see here three, uh, three items which we use to kind of make the, the notification of the claim as objective as possible. And uh, while this is, why do we do this? I mean, the, the, the human subjectivity in the process is typically one of the main drivers of kind of deviations or let's say dispersion of the, of the results. Um, of estimation results. And uh, of course, digital technology and AI can help in here. And most prominently, uh, what you certainly have seen today, and I think it was in Somil's uh, very initial example on, on, on the screen uh, with kind of visual intelligence, assessing, uh, assessing photos and assessing damage features uh, on, on, uh, on, on photos. And I'll come to that in a minute as to how we go about that. Um, but there is also other aspects that we can that we can leverage, like with the advent of the vehicles, uh, access to vehicle telemetry and other operational data, as, as we saw from, from uh, connected vehicles, the vehicle itself will become a source of, of highly objective data about an incident and related physical implications, such as the damages and how actually the incident occurred. Uh, so we work on such solutions as well, but I will not go into details today on that. And th there's actually a public, uh, public announcement on the internet from Porsche, uh, where we were chosen as one of the winners of their recent data cup hackathon related to exactly this use case. And then thirdly, what we also have is for, for very specific features required in some situations where you cannot conclusively infer. Uh, from photos or from the vehicle data, uh, a point that is needed for the input. Uh, we also have a kind of a user interface, dynamic, configurable uh, dialogue flow engine to pull such answers from, from the user in an interactive manner. And arguably then the, the most important thing is the third bubble here, uh, items three and four in purple and dark blue, which are the actual real-time uh, estimation models. Uh, to, uh, on the one hand side, assess the, 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 the loss from an economic perspective, but also the settlement recommendation and potential uh, anomalies in, in, in the case. Anomalies also kind of indicating possibly some fraudulent, uh, fraudulent situations. Uh, I'll not go into the details how we achieve this, um, other than kind of mentioning that we do this also in a, in a kind of model stacking approach, because you could have very different very different uh, segments of, of, of damage, uh, damage patterns, so to speak. So very light, uh, light damages, where we go for more traditional approaches and then very heavy damages like the one on this picture here, uh, where we use fully, um, uh, a fully predictive uh, machine learned um, uh, model uh, uh, together with partners to, to assess the loss. Um, but what I want to what I want to show or, or, or yield to you, you see here at the, at the bottom the uh, expected repair cost, the, the settlement decision. This is obviously an economic total loss. Uh, the confidence value we see as a result, and the next actions uh, that should be taken uh, with with the vehicle, which we can uh, find from a uh, from a machine machine decision. Some might ask the question, is this really working? And we can say yes, uh, if it's done right, uh, trained with the right data, it works. Uh, we see insurers, for example, in Germany, applying such a model and they get settlement decisions in, in uh, beyond 80% of their physical damage claims, which they can process with and uh, decide with, with just that model. Um, however, it is very important, I mean, coming back maybe to the presentation you saw, the one before the previous one, um, that this does not replace the need for a repair worker to actually assign his expertise to assess and estimate the actual repair in the case where there is a repair needed. Uh, however, what is facilitated is the, the agreement of the, uh, the repair order in, in that uh, solution. Um, and that makes obviously the end-to-end -end flow much more efficient, and it reduces some control steps from the uh, from the flow, and thereby also introducing uh, large cost uh, cost reductions. Now, I want to, as I mentioned, give a, a brief view on our uh, uh, views and considerations and solutions in the space of the kind of image recognition and visual intelligence. Uh, what we observe in the market is, I mean, this is a hype topic, and uh, 
uh, but we would see this to become really commoditized uh, over time more and more and more. There's this new service provider today that is really standing out by a distance. Uh, we would expect that to remain as such over the next, uh, the next few years. And uh, what we did is we integrated uh, a few of the leading, uh, integrated and assessed a few of the, the, the leading visual intelligence providers um, uh, for vehicle uh, feature, uh, damage feature extraction. Um, and we also created for some specific uh, use cases uh, uh, our, own, uh, our own models. And in practice, what we saw is that all of these models demonstrated individual strengths and weaknesses uh, and biases, and we therefore decided to go for a more AI-based uh, ensemble model approach, uh, which we trained on expert-labeled data sets to kind of stack the VI visual intelligence uh, services to correct systematic errors in there. And by doing so, um, uh, achieve a kind of a, a boosting of the performance of, of a, a singular singular service, which is kind of a, a common approach, but it took uh, uh, it took quite a bit of effort to uh, to conceive it, and that's what this slide kind of depicts here on the from uh, coming from the ground truth of, of a kind of uh, expert of our own ranks, and then the X many or N modules uh, to a, to an ensemble approach and. Uh, we, 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 of course, in reality, the model is much more complicated um, and we have much more features, but we cannot uh, disclose that at this stage just due to patent uh, applications uh, which are ongoing. Uh, yet one thing we are confident is the value proposition for our clients, which is this reduces dependency from locking in with one vendor uh, and then kind of having potential switching costs if that vendor doesn't prove to be the best. And secondly, of course, uh, we're getting, uh, in, in any case, uh, we're observing a better prediction uh, uh, quality or performance o over a singular service. In some areas, over 30%, but uh, I mean, we do not really publish that on uh, broader average numbers as we expect that to develop uh, over time. So it's just basically uh, too early. Um, so uh, having said that, this kind of structured digital representation of claim data and loss data is, is of course, uh, super interesting to then feed and enrich, uh, let's say, risk assessment and scoring for other kind of mobility uh, mobility products. And uh, combined with real-time data acquisition that we, we, we learned from connected vehicles, uh, ideally directly from the from the OEM, uh, enables a holistic scoring solution. And that's what I just want to show you here from a, from a conceptual perspective. Uh, again, that's in, uh, in patent application. That's why I cannot show you the prototype right now. But I think the key thing that, that we added here is um, we move from a kind of traditional static two-dimensional severity frequency uh, risk assessment into a dynamic uh, profiling, which adds the time dimension to vehicle scoring. Um, this is depicted with these three cubes here and the three kind of data points. Um, and we have three building blocks at the, uh, at the beginning, which is the, the vehicle features and the usage uh, features and the related risk scores. So that considers the internal condition of the vehicle and the status of the subsystems, such as assistance systems, at the time when they are engaged and potentially even combining with their with data from them, uh, as well as trip and mileage. And then the driver profile, I mean, that speaks for itself. That's basically everything that is individual and specific to the way the risk of uh, a specific person driving uh, a vehicle. And then thirdly, the contextual and environmental uh, data that provides almost like an external risk that, that considers uh, about where the driving occurs under which kind of hyper local conditions such as road user density, weather, temporary road work, etc. Uh, and we believe that this uh, resulting holistic dynamic risk score will, will enable a, a whole new category of, uh, of innovative uh, insurance products in, in the mobility space and, and will obviously provide a much more transparent uh, assessment and, and pricing of, the, uh, of mobility risks. And to kind of close this presentation and bring this back to the original mission of anticipating new risks and solutions to assess and, and manage, uh, it's obvious that we also need to expand um, and say what, what's, what, what's the next step. And 
that's of course the, the look at what risks are uh, they are coming by uh, uh, from autonomous fully autonomous uh, vehicles right? uh, we understand uh, or i think everybody would agree that autonomous vehicles will ultimately mean safer roads but uh, like any automated technology, they are not and, and it will not come uh, risk free. Um, and so we are currently researching solutions to assess these new emerging risk types, uh, also on the back of, uh, of AI based models, um, extending the models that we already have and working with OEMs and prototypes to capture data. Um, these new risk categories are, of course, I mean, the main block there is, is the AI behavior of risks so and the AI becomes the driver. What does that mean? Um, and uh, secondly, of course, also because these, these vehicles will have uh, will be constructed totally differently from their components. Um, they need to have, the, they bring a certain risk when these components fail. So there's an internal, uh, internal risk uh, in, in, involved. A third, of course, what happens when the connectivity gets lost and the vehicle is is, is all of a sudden uh, on, on its own. Uh, a fourth one is a cyber risk, which kind of speaks for it on, on its own from, from the terminology. And the fifth one is actually only applicable for uh, risk levels uh, less than level five, so not for non-fully autonomous uh, vehicles where a driver is still needed or an operator is still needed to some extent. There's obviously a risk from kind of human vehicle interaction uh, for example, just from vehicle operator being overconfident or even incompetent in using the assistance functionalities that are that are provided. In any case, the um, the reconstruction of accidents will be extremely important, specifically at the beginning, because uh, obviously there will be a tendency to assign the fault and the indemnity to the uh, to the AV uh, uh, provider. Um, uh, kind of leveraging a bit the, the, the big pocket uh, approach, knowing that these are companies today that are uh, highly, uh, highly valued. So in closing, we, we believe with these solutions, we can actually contribute to make the mobility more safe. Uh, on the one hand side today, as we've seen with the things that already deploy, but also in the future, and thereby kind of make the world more, more resilient according to our, to our mission. And uh, with that, I kind of, I'm at the end of the presentation, and uh, thanks a lot for the uh, for the attention. I try to stop the screen share so that I can see you again. Hello. I need to try to. Where can I stop the screen share? Ah. Oh. Sorry, I wanted to stop the screen share. Is it better? Uh, yes, the screen share is off. You cool. <laughs> Sorry, I kind of struggled to get into this. this. I'm not using Chrome usually. <laughs> not Nitin, you're on mute. Still. Nitin? Uh, looks like he's having some technical difficulties getting his uh, voice going. Hmm. Nitin, I think you're still on mute. He has to reconnect. Uh, no, still mute.
Hi, Dedrich. Uh, thank you for your uh, talk. Can I unmute you? No. Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, there was uh, some technical uh, thing which was uh, happened to Nitin. So thank, thanks for your talk and uh, lovely presentation. And uh, it was an uh, insightful session. I uh, hope uh, anybody have any question for that, Dedrich? And obviously, I think as we're over time, everybody can reach out to me anytime. Yes. The contact this is, is, is anyways so, uh, listed in the, uh, in, in the presentation that will be shared. Yes, absolutely. Uh, anybody can uh, reach out to us uh, so that we can connect uh, that reach. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, everybody. So it was a lovely session. I uh, hope uh, you all enjoyed and uh, if you have any question, you can kindly reach out to us. Thanks, everybody. Sure. Thanks, Arvind. Yeah. Cheers. Bye.